This is Audible. HarperCollins presents Perfect Kill by Helen Fields. Read by Robin Ling. Chapter 1 At precisely the same time Bart was coming round from a chemically induced sleep, his mother was waking from a herbal insomnia remedy and wondering why the house was so quiet. It wasn't a Sunday. On Sundays, Bart neither had college nor work, and occasionally he slept in. Not all that often, but sometimes. Maggie rolled onto her side and rubbed bleary eyes, trying to focus on the small travel clock perched on her bedside table. 9am. She'd overslept. Not that she had anywhere to be in a hurry, but mornings... It was a Wednesday, she realised, were marked with the clanging of crockery, the pouring of cereal, and the sound of the dishwasher being loaded before Bart exited the house. He was a good boy. The sort of boy her friends were rather jealous of. She was conscious of the fact, once in a while moaning about him a little to make it clear that he wasn't perfect, although secretly she knew he was. She might tell her neighbour that he played his music too loud or pretend to her weekly library social group that he was forgetful about tidying his room. But Bart was neither loud nor untidy. In fact, he was independent, considerate and helpful. An exception among other twenty-year-old men. Boys, Maggie thought. Twenty was no age at all. Certainly not mature enough to comprehend all the cruelties the world had to offer. But then Bart had grown up quickly after his father had been killed serving in Afghanistan. Not in battle. That would have been devastating, of course. The truth had garnered more pity and less admiration from the community. Her husband had choked in the mess hall one night when a fellow officer had cracked a particularly hilarious joke. The steak he'd been chewing was sucked up into his airways where it had stubbornly lodged and refused to move in spite of no end of back-smacking. Then, a desperate attempt at the Heimlich manoeuvre, which had broken ribs, but not allowed any oxygen to his lungs. How did you explain that to a fourteen-year-old boy? That his father, who'd been a military man since before Bart was born, had been dispatched not by bomb or bullet, but by a mouthful of protein. Perhaps Bart was ill, Maggie thought. Or maybe she'd taken too many sleeping tablets and not heard him leave the house. That had happened before. Distracted, after a long shift at the call centre, she'd returned home and taken a sleep saver, eaten dinner, then swallowed another pill without thinking. Such were the perils of tiredness. Living on a military widow's pension and her wages was too tight for comfort, even with Bart earning a few extra pounds waiting tables on a Saturday. Bart, you all right, love? she called, pulling her tatty pink dressing gown over bare shoulders. Bart had bought her a new one for Christmas. It was exquisite, cream, and so soft it was like one of the really posh, cuddly toys you seemed always to find in bookshops for some inexplicable reason. It was hanging on the back of her bedroom door, and she stroked it every time she entered or exited. But it was too nice to wear. She'd only spill coffee down it, or splash it with the remnants of the previous night's pasta sauce. The thought of spoiling something so luxurious and thoughtful was enough to keep her in her threadbare robe, at least for another six months or so. She'd start wearing it before Christmas came around, she told herself. Bart hadn't replied by the time she'd reached his bedroom door, knocking politely, always mindful that her boy needed his privacy. He'd never brought a girl back for the night, not that Maggie would have minded if they'd been discreet, but Bart conducted his relationships elsewhere. He obviously had girlfriends. He was a good-looking lad. And that wasn't just the blur of seeing him through mummy goggles. At six foot, he was big enough to stand out, but not so tall that he attracted silly comments on the street. His father had been six foot four, and once threatened to deck a man who had somehow imagined that no one had ever asked her husband what the weather was like up there. Maggie's husband, God rest his soul, had been a decent man, but not blessed with looks, 
all sharp features and eyes closer together than suited the average face. She was the exact opposite. Broad, flat face, wide eyes, wide hips too, and getting wider by the year, she reminded herself. Perhaps their differences had endowed Bart with a sort of symmetrical, well-balanced face that wasn't exactly attention-grabbing, but with which no one could find a single fault. Great skin, even teeth, good bone structure, and a fair brain. He was in his final year of a business studies college course that he was hoping would offer a career in London. Plenty of work in Edinburgh, Maggie always told him, or Glasgow if he wanted to leave home. Anywhere in Scotland. But London was his dream. Always had been. Even that was too distant for her liking. But she knew that letting go was all part of the painful parenting experience. In the absence of a reply to her knocking, Maggie opened the door slowly, calling his name softly as she put a foot inside. The curtains were open and the bed was made. Nothing surprising there. His lectures started at 9am every day. He'd have left an hour ago to make sure he was in good time. Bart wasn't the sort of student who ever turned up late. But he hadn't woken her up. His normal routine was to wake, shower, have breakfast, clear up the kitchen, and to take her a cup of tea before leaving the house. She, in turn, would rise later, do the washing, shop, and leave something tasty in the slow cooker before going off for her shift which started at lunchtime and went on until 8pm. Telesales was thankless that they hadn't missed a mortgage payment yet. It wasn't the lack of a cup of tea that bothered Maggie. Her son was entitled to forget doing that for her. She counted her blessings on a daily basis for him, with or without his little kindnesses. What she couldn't understand was why his mobile was still sitting on his bed, charging exactly where he'd left it the night before when he dashed out to grab an extra shift at the restaurant. Another waiter had called in sick. Bart had been offered the hours, and the thought of boosting his savings account was too tempting to refuse. The pay wasn't great, but the tips were, and he always attracted enough customer goodwill to make a night's work worthwhile. His phone had been running on empty, so he'd left it on his bed charging ready for the next morning. Maggie had watched him plug it in and she delivered a pile of freshly ironed clothes for him to put away. Those two were sitting patiently on the bed for his return. She squashed the stupid maternal panic that made the stable bedroom floor feel suddenly like quicksand. So her boy hadn't come home. Perhaps he'd met up with friends and gone for a drink, or had a better offer from a pretty girl. Only normally he'd have called her, however late, let her know to put the chain on the door, tell her not to worry. Bart was thoughtful like that. His father had taught him well. Maggie took the stairs carefully and checked the answer phone on the landline. No message. She didn't have a mobile. It was just one more bill that she didn't need. Plastering an optimistic smile on her face, she popped her head through the door of the lounge all ready to have a good laugh, in case he'd had a few too many and slept on the couch. She was fooling no one with the false jollity, least of all herself. Bart wasn't an excessive drinker. He'd never reached a point where the couch looked like a better option than his own bed. Before she could stop it, her mind began conjuring the ghosts of accidents. Somewhere in there, a misadventure with a stake loomed large, like father, like son. Wouldn't that be the ultimate irony? Both of them gone, cause of death, unchewed meat. Stop it, you silly woman. She scolded herself, wandering into the kitchen to make her own cup of breakfast tea. Your boy'll be back any minute. But the truth that Maggie had felt, in that secret, vile part of the brain no parent ever wanted to hear pipe up, was that her boy wouldn't be back in a minute. Not by any stretch of the imagination, because by then, Bartholomew Campbell was already two hundred miles away. It was the stench that woke him. Something acrid, with a heavy undertone of sulphur, had filled his sinuses and was threatening to make him gag. Mum? His first thought was that she must be ill, 
that she had gone down with food poisoning or a virus overnight and had been too embarrassed or too thoughtful to have disturbed him. Only he couldn't remember getting home. And now that he registered the pain in his body, Bart realised he wasn't in his bed. Or any bed at all. He sat bolt upright, head swimming, before collapsing back down to the floor. Everything was dark. Not the dark of Scottish nights away from the city camping by a loch. Not even the dark of the private rooms at the back of the nightclub he occasionally attended with his friends. True dark. Not one star. No bloom of pollution. No crack or spill from beneath a door or the edge of a blind. Hello? Bart shouted, braving movement again, sitting up more slowly. That was when he felt a tugging on his leg. He froze. Something had hold of his left ankle. He breathed hard, twice, three times, tried to get to grips with his fear. Then he lost it. Get off me! He yelled, wrenching his foot upwards, trying to scrabble away. He hit a wall with his head shortly before his foot locked solid and his hip popped from its socket. The scream he let out was loud enough to wake the entire terrace where he lived. He rolled right, instinct kicking in, and the displaced hip shifted again back into the socket, easing the dreadful pain and allowing him to lean forward to take hold of whatever had his foot. He didn't want to extend his hand. There was something about reaching his fingers out into the black void that seemed to be inviting a bite. Like slipping your hand into a murky river in the sort of place where, when animals attacked, the general reaction to the news was, What the hell did the idiot tourist expect? What Bart found was both less and more terrifying. His ankle was bound by a leather strap. There was no bogeyman occupying the darkness with him. Not one that had hold of his leg, anyway. The strap was thick and sturdy, with a chunky metal link sewn through it. At the end of that, he realised miserably, was a chain. What was at the end of the chain, Bart wasn't sure he was ready to discover yet. So he did what all cautious people would do in a foul, pitch-black room, finding themselves inexplicably chained up he began calling out for help. His cries went in an arc. He called for help, stopped, listened, called out again, this time louder, stopped, listened. Bart could feel the rumbling below the floor more readily than he could hear the engine, but an engine it unmistakably was. He put his hand down flat. The surface was rough but not cold, neither wood nor metal, more like the sort of industrial liner that was used to insulate modern houses. He'd seen it being carried in huge sheets into Edinburgh's ever-growing new housing estates. Perhaps he was in a factory then, in a room high above the machinery. That made sense. The low-level growl of metal and the lack of sharp sounds from the outside world. He pressed himself closer to the wall and began yelling afresh, Hello? Anyone? Can anyone hear me? Help! I need help! His cries got louder, his voice higher. He banged on the wall first, then the floor between phrases, punctuating his cries for assistance. His cries became screams. Bart had never heard himself scream before. It was terrifying. Then he was hammering on the wall and stamping on the floor at the same time as he screamed. Just make noise, he thought. Someone would hear him. Someone would come. But what if it was the wrong someone? No, he told himself. Not that. Those thoughts were what would stop him being rescued. If all he had was a short window of time before whoever had chained him up was due to come back, he had to make all the noise he could right now. He took some steadying breaths. Think. The chain on his ankle allowed him limited movement. He walked along the edge as far as he could, tapping as he went, feeling for the edge of a doorway or handle, listening for a place where there might be an exit. 
nothing. Then he walked the other way along the wall, tapping all the time. A crash at his feet made him leap backwards. He tripped and fell, scrabbling away. The darkness made everything nearer and louder. He'd never considered what a threat the lack of light was before. Everything was alien. His sense of distance and direction had completely gone. As the noise faded, he reached out tentatively, groping the floor for whatever it was he'd hit. His fingers found the bucket a couple of feet away on its side, still rolling gently to and fro. He grabbed the handle and pulled it closer, exploring its edges, neither brave nor stupid enough to put his hand all the way inside. The smell coming from in there was its own unique warning. Human waste was remarkably distinctive. Neither cat, cow, dog nor pig excrement came close to replicating its odour. Bart contemplated what it meant. The bucket's edge was rough with what could only be rust. Its outside was dry and there was no liquid slopping anywhere. Not recently used, then. Yet it was there for a reason. It's here for me, he whispered, not liking the rawness in his throat from all the yelling. He'd lost track of the time he'd spent calling out to apparently absent listeners. He'd be lucky if he could speak at all within the hour. Setting the bucket down, he took stock. There were two options left. Sit down, huddle, wait it out. Someone had delivered him there, yet he had no idea how that had happened. His new girlfriend, if he could even call her that so early on, had met him in the restaurant as he'd finished his shift, and he'd been about to go back to her place for a while. After that was a steady blank in his memory. But his situation couldn't be accidental. His captors would be back. If he chose not to simply wait, he could assess the situation, explore his surroundings, try to figure out the state of play. That was a phrase he remembered his father using on his infrequent trips home from active duty. He summoned whatever genetic courage might inhabit his DNA. What he learned was that bravery was a myth. In the end, fear was a more generous motivator. If Bart waited, things could only get worse. He could think of no earthly reason why anyone would want him. Perhaps it was a case of mistaken identity by some chancer who thought he was from a wealthy family able to pay a ransom. Maybe it was some sort of bizarre terrorist event. And they were the better options. More likely, much more likely... It was some sick fuck who wanted to rape, then kill him. He wasn't sitting on the floor and waiting for that. Forcing himself to get to his feet, Bart checked his pockets. His wallet was gone, not that he'd imagined it might still be there. The only item still on him was the photo of his father that he carried everywhere. His dad in full uniform, carrying his baby son in his arms. On the back, his father had written the immortal words, Bart, I may not always be by your side, but I will always come back to you. Love, Dad. Kiss, kiss, kiss. He clutched the photo for a moment, then shoved it securely into his pocket again. Whatever else he'd lost, he couldn't bear the thought of losing that, too. He felt for the wall, arms stretched out so that only his fingertips were touching it, and tried to measure the space. Four walls, rectangular maybe twelve foot by twenty. Then he followed the length of chain and found that it was attached to a central metal loop in the floor and secured with a hefty padlock. No discernible door. Five other objects turned up as he searched the floor on his hands and knees. A coarse blanket that reeked of damp and sweat. He bundled it up and kept it close to his chest, as much as a comforter as for warmth. A woman's shoe, its high heel snapped and hanging half off, lay on its side in a corner. A large container of water that smelled fresh enough. A box of food. Packets of crisps, biscuits and chocolate, he decided from the smell. All junk, nothing fresh. 
but it would keep him alive for a couple of weeks. The thought that he was supposed to stay alive quelled his immediate panic. The cell was part of his journey, not his final destination. He had time to take stock and prepare for whatever lay ahead. Finally, standing, he bumped into something dangling from the wall, also chained, that squeaked back and forth when he knocked it. Reaching out, he identified its hexagonal shape, felt the chill of glass around its sides, then his fingers found the dial. He turned the metal cog. Light, enough to barely illuminate a one-metre radius, spilled from the lamp. Bart let out a soft coo. Amazing how such a simple thing could suddenly mean more than all the money in the world, given an appropriate degree of terror. The colours it shed were dappled, a sickly yellow nearer the top from the old bulb, graduating into a dull pink in the middle, then brown at the bottom. Bart stepped closer, letting his eyes adjust. It wasn't that the glass panes were coloured, he realised, nor that a special effect had been used on the bulb. The outside of the glass had been spattered red. He reached out his fingers, hesitantly, wanting to know, not wanting to know. The lantern's panes were bloodied with delicate streaks, settling at the bottom, different layers, subtly varied shades, a mixture of very old, crackled blood, like a glaze on an antique vase, then newer, congealed blood. A single blob came away on his finger, congealed but not yet fully hardened. Bart sank to the floor in the small circle of light, an actor mid-stage in a spotlight with no audience to appreciate the beautiful tragedy being played out. Then he pulled the blanket around himself and wondered how long both the lamplight and he would last. Chapter 2 Elinuta ran. Three flights down the staircase, she headed for the exit onto the street, hoping no other door opened as she passed it. Each of those apartments was as dangerous to her as the one she had just escaped. Dressed only in a tattered halter neck top and lycra miniskirt, no underwear, no shoes, she raced downwards, jumping the last three steps, praying her ankles wouldn't sprain. She needed to be able to run. Looking upwards, she checked the situation. No one was following. Yet. It would only be sixty seconds or so before they realised she was missing, though. Forcing herself not to barge through the outer door and have it slam, she moved carefully, slipping out into the night air. Dumbrydon Gardens was still unfamiliar after the month she'd lived there. Inevitable, given that she hadn't been allowed out of the flat. Planks over the inside of the windows meant she couldn't even assess the terrain from above. She'd wondered why the police hadn't become suspicious. Windows covered from the inside were never indicators of lawful activity. One of the women who'd been held in the flats the longest had explained... Looks perfectly normal from outside. Kids' curtains, flowery curtains, princesses, bullshit rainbows and hearts. They put the planks on with the curtains still up. A week later, the woman had disappeared, never to return. None of the other girls knew a thing about it. There were hypotheses and horrified speculation, but nothing solid save for one scrap of information that had got Elinuta where she was now. Perhaps a client had got too rough and killed her, was the most popular opinion. Then there was the option that she'd contracted a disease that would render her useless for sex trafficking purposes. Finlay did his best to keep his girls clean, not for their sakes, but so that his punters kept coming back for more. No one was going to do that, with their dick resembling a root vegetable and leaking pus. Perhaps she'd escaped, one of the other women had whispered. There was a rumour about a key being sewn into the hem of one of her skirts. That was why Elenuta had requested that any spare clothes in the house be given to her. She had pleaded that hers were no longer fit to be worn, and that hadn't required much acting. Finlay had given her grief about it. As one of the newest members of what Finlay laughingly called his team, Elenuta was popular with the clients and made more money than anyone else. 
the clothes landed at her feet one day during her allotted shower time. The key had been shoved roughly into the picked-open hem of a pair of shorts. After that, the problem had been finding a moment when no one was guarding the outer door. That hurdle had suddenly and bizarrely been overcome when a man had walked in carrying a bulging newspaper package, smelling of hot chocolate and shouting, "'Deep-fried Mars bars, you fat fuckers!' Without a second thought, Elenuta had grabbed the key and gone for it. Now she had no plan. All she could do was follow her instincts. Turning left, she raced through an alleyway between the block she'd left and another that sat at a right angle to it. Put some distance in place first, then consider what to do, she told herself. Several of the streetlights were broken. Sometimes during the day she had the sounds of rocks being thrown, the odd cheer when there was a hit. The darkness provided both shelter and a disadvantage. Her pursuers knew the area well. A line of terraced houses was on one side, the rear of another block of flats on the other. She couldn't see a main road, which was what she'd been hoping for. Flagging down a car would be her fastest way out of the area. And it wasn't as if there was any definable risk of being raped. Not after twelve different men had been allowed into a room already that day. There were rewards and penalties depending on your behaviour. If you wanted to eat, you did what you were told without complaint. If you didn't want to be beaten raw, you did what you were told. If you didn't want to be injected with heroin against your will, you did what any man asked you to without moaning and without tears. Unless they wanted to see you cry. Several of them did. She wasn't sure exactly what time it was, but it had to be after 2am. That was when the stream of customers began to tail off. Few lights shone from the windows of the houses. Pausing to get her breath, it had been several weeks since she'd walked more than a few paces in one go. Elenuta considered her options. Stand in the middle of the housing estate and scream like a banshee to attract maximum attention and scare off her pursuers. Or run from door to door, hoping some kind person would open up, immediately believe what she told them and protect her until the police arrived. A slammed door, cursing, then a shout from behind her helped make up her mind. She needed to buy more time. If they saw her, they'd be on her in a matter of seconds. The front doors weren't worth the risk. Dipping low, she headed for the rear of the properties, knowing the problem would be dogs in the back gardens, but discounting the danger. She'd been throttled, beaten, drugged, and assaulted more ways than she'd known were possible since being kidnapped in her native Romania. Getting into a fight with a bull mastiff looked like a clean exit from her perspective. If they barked, they were going to give away her location. That was a risk she had no choice but to take. Her whole body ached. The adrenaline of escape wouldn't last much longer. Tiredness was setting in, partly through sheer terror, partly because her food had been rationed to weaken her. It was working. She took the first fence easily enough, scratching the inside of her leg on the chicken wire. Didn't matter. Just one more injury to add to the multitude of others. The next garden had a higher wooden construction. She looked longingly at the back door, wondering if she could risk giving up running and starting to wake people. The problem was that back doors didn't have doorbells. She would have to knock and call out if she was going to rouse people at that time. She steeled herself. Better to be cautious and make sure she was safe before revealing her presence. It seemed wiser to get at least four houses in before starting to hammer on a door. Climbing first onto a wheelbarrow, then a barbecue, she took the high fence, making it over the top, then losing her hold and falling to the ground, a tool of some sort smashing into her ribs. Still, she didn't cry out. The worst of the noise was soaked up by the mud and wet grass she landed in, but there was, nevertheless, a dull thud as she hit the earth. She learned the hard way recently how to stay silent and endure pain. It turned out to be a useful lesson now. Light-headed and suddenly overwhelmed with nausea, she stayed where she was before daring to move. A light came on in the upstairs window, attracting her attention and undoubtedly also alerting her pursuers to her whereabouts. This was it then. Just two houses in, 
and that would have to do. She was hoping a woman would live there, maybe fifty years old, mature enough to know desperation when she saw it, and compassionate enough to want to help. It shouldn't be a family with young children. They wouldn't want to invite her in and wait for the police to attend. No one in their right mind would want someone as battered and unclean as her in the same house as their babies. Rolling onto her stomach and pushing herself up, she knew she looked awful. There weren't any mirrors in the flat, mainly because it would be too easy to break them and create a weapon. It had the benefit of stopping the woman from realising how dreadful they looked. But imagination worked just as well. Elenuta began banging the back door with both hands, with her fists curled one around the other, kicking it at the same time. The owner was already awake. She just had to get them downstairs. Please, she shouted. Help me. Need help. Call police. I'm kidnapped. Her English was good, but not perfect. Enough to make herself understood, which was all she needed. An upstairs window slid open at the house next door. Would you shut your fucking hole, wench? Help me! She screeched. The window slammed shut. She's in the gardens, a man shouted. Chunky, get over there and shut her up. They were coming. Last chance. A witch house? Another man yelled in response. Second one in, I reckon. Not going back. I'm not going back. Somebody help, please! She screeched into the sky. Call police! Police, help! Bending down, she grabbed a large stone frog from the path, turning her head aside to avoid the shrapnel and lobbed it through the glass pane in the back door. It shattered instantly, and lights were suddenly blazing in the kitchen. A man's hand, then his leg, appeared over the wooden fence. The door opened. Get in here, a man hissed, grabbing her by the arm and yanking her into the kitchen, shutting the door behind her just as heavy boots thumped down into the dirt. Please, you must call police, Elenita said. They will take me. Don't you worry yourself, the man said. I know all about it. Finlay, is this what you were looking for? Finlay Wilson appeared in the kitchen doorway. Five foot four, skin and bones, with tiny, wide-set eyes that made him appear more reptilian than human. Aye, that's my skank, he grinned. More teeth were missing than not, and those that remained were a shade of yellow usually reserved only for dog vomit. Good man, Jean. We'll be out of your way now. Elenita looked from Finlay to the man she'd assumed was about to save her, to the huge figure, presumably the man called Chunky, who was outside the back door ensuring she couldn't escape into the garden. There was going to be no escape, no police rescue, no return to her home and family. Served her right for falling for such an old trick, the promise of a better job, flattery, more money, just a job interview to go through. Then there was the back of a truck, a gag over her mouth, ropes around her wrists and feet. Days of travelling like that, lumped in with a few other women, in a wooden box in the centre of a cattle transport. It didn't matter how much noise they tried to make, they never had a hope of being heard. From there, they'd been transferred into a lined cargo container and lifted onto a ship. Insufficient water had left them all dehydrated. At some point, she'd lost hope that they would survive. When they'd reached land, she'd begun to wish they hadn't. She'd given it her best shot. There wouldn't be another chance to escape. That left only one option. Throwing herself forward, she grabbed a knife from the block next to the sink, diving into the opposite corner of the room and holding it to her own throat. I'd rather die, she said her hand shaking fiercely enough that the blade was already leaving a ragged trail over her skin. Would you now? Finlay asked, stepping forward, a smile playing at the corner of his lips. That's as may be, but what'll your wee friend back at the flat do without you? There's a special event on soon, see, and I've had my eye on you for it. 
problem is, if you act up like a little bitch right now and mess up my plans, there'll be a vacancy. He got up close to Elinuta's face. What's that kid's name? Annika. That's it. I was touched by how you looked after her on her birthday last week. Sweet sixteen. That's a bit younger than the girls I normally race, but if you fuck with me, I'll make an exception. Elinuta lowered the knife. She didn't need any time to think about it. Finlay had proved multiple times in the last month that he never joked about anything. Whatever race he was talking about, Annika wouldn't survive it. It was a miracle she'd survived the trip across Europe to start with, and she'd grown more withdrawn with every man they sent into her bedroom. Not your problem, a wormy voice whispered in her ear. End it now. Better like this. Only that wasn't her. Annika reminded her of her little sister. It could as easily have been her, trapped like a tiny bird in the disgusting cage on the fourth floor of flats, all of which seemed to be controlled by Finlay and his men. Sensible girl, Finlay whispered, taking the knife from her compliant hand and getting a grip on her upper arm, ready to march her out. Finn, man, do I no get a free sock off at least, seeing as I told you she was in my garden, after she broke my window too, Jean whined. You've got your right hand, that'll have to do. This girl and I have business to sort out. Finlay dragged her towards the front door. Oh, am I supposed to pay for the broken window, you fucking wanker? Is that all the thanks I get? I should call the bloody police on you, see how you like that? Treating everyone round here like shite, thinking you're the big man. Ella Nutter caught the single nod Finlay issued to the man who'd been guarding the back door, and who was now standing with his hand through the glass she'd so recently smashed. Well, I'm no scared of you. You've got some paying back to do. Did you really think we'd all stay quiet about what you've got going on up the road? Jean continued, oblivious. There was a single gunshot. More whoosh than bang. The louder noise was the splatter of blood and bone fragments hitting the wall. Staring at the mess, Elinuta came to terms with what she'd already known, even if her stubborn brain had kept on trying to see a light at the end of the tunnel. She'd left one shoe inside the container on that ship. One of her best shoes, that she'd thought she was wearing to the job interview that would change her life and her family's fortunes. With it, she'd left behind both hope and her faith in human nature. In every way that mattered, she was already dead. Finlay dragged her across the broken glass and through the back door into the garden. She didn't even feel the shard that pierced her heel. Chapter 3 Malcolm Riley would have been staring at the ceiling of the mortuary if his eyes were still in their sockets. Detective Inspector Luke Callanach found it harder to stare at the young man's face than the bodies he'd seen before. There was something so macabre, so alien, about a face without its eyes. And that wasn't all that was missing. Eyes, heart, liver, lungs, pancreas, the French pathologist listed, gallbladder, kidneys, and testicles. But the penis is still there, Jean-Paul asked. As the Interpol agent heading up the investigation, in conjunction with French police, Jean-Paul was in charge. That was fine with Kalanach. He was only in France as Scottish liaison officer to Interpol temporarily, or so he'd been told on arrival three months earlier. After nearly two years in Scotland, he was still more accustomed to hearing English than French, and his head was performing a bizarre, unnecessary translation between the two. He'd spent the previous twelve weeks trying to trace human traffickers who were allegedly moving women from Eastern Europe to the West and from Spain and Portugal up as far as Denmark and Scotland. Now the body of a Scottish national had been found in the housing projects at Flandre, northeast of Paris's city centre, and it had made sense for Callanach to attend. Local police had reported a corpse. The truth was that only a shell remained. 
See for yourself, the pathologist told them, peeling down the sheet. The body was one long, open wound, cut from sternum to groin, with a cross cut below the ribcage. You didn't make any of these cuts, Kalanach clarified. I didn't need to. Whoever opened him up didn't make any effort to sew him back up. This was how he was found. The incisions were made with a scalpel, though, and with some care. The cuts were deep enough to allow entry, but no organs would have been damaged. I'd imagine the organs themselves were removed cleanly. There's little additional trauma, technically speaking. Whoever did this knew their way around the inside of a human body. You think we're looking for a doctor? Jean-Paul asked. I wouldn't insult my profession by calling whatever maniac killed this boy a doctor, but someone with medical knowledge, certainly. So, all the organs were removed in a single operation, then? Jean-Paul clarified. I would say so. What else can you tell us about his death? Kalanach asked, taking photos he wished he wouldn't have to print out and stare at on a police station wall several hours a day. What most people didn't understand about a crime scene wall was that the photos weren't simply there for evidential purposes. Those visuals also ensured that you would work every single minute just so you could take them down again. His stomach was half full when he died, and he would have been an average weight. His external skin was clean. Save for the removal of his eyes also surgical in nature, there are no scratches or contusions on his face, nor the rest of his body, save for some old bruising on his knuckles. Chafing on one of his ankles suggests that a restraint was used at some point, but that it was padded. It's hard to talk about the cause of death without the major organs to examine, but there's insufficient other trauma for me to conclude that this young man died from anything other than the result of this surgery. Given the attempt to dispose of the body, I guess we can discount any legitimate form of organ transplant surgery. Jean-Paul commented. I'd say that was a fair assumption. The pathologist agreed. There's no brain trauma and no signs of long-term illness, but I'm severely limited in reaching conclusions. Superficially, he seems to have been healthy. Someone looked after him, Kalanak said. They wanted him in good shape. It must be organ harvesting, Jean-Paul intervened, except for the testicles, obviously. No, even those can be transplanted, actually, the pathologist said. It's rare, but feasible. Interpol helped close down an international operation like this two years ago. Most of those involved are now imprisoned, but there were inevitably a few who escaped, mainly on the administrative side. We'll review the case. It might give us somewhere to start. Jean-Paul started texting something on his phone as Kalanach stepped up to take a closer look inside the body cavity. How long do organs last outside the body before they absolutely have to be transplanted into the new host? Kalanach asked. Depends on the organ, the pathologist said. Typically, a maximum of 30 hours for a kidney, up to 12 for the liver or pancreas, no more than 6 hours for lungs. Recent developments with storage boxes have meant that we can now keep a heart functioning outside the body for up to 12 hours, but you're talking about having access to the very best technology. Not a problem if someone's willing to pay. Jean-Paul said. But the chance of having all the recipients ready at the same time, at best within a day and a half of one another, that seems... Kalanach stared grimly into the half-empty abdominal cavity. Well, difficult, given that we're talking about an off-the-grid transplant. You don't understand how professionally these operations are set up, Jean-Paul told him. They run fully staffed clinics that look completely above board. Take the donor. Have patients ready. It's last chance for most of them. 
They're too far down the waiting list to have a realistic shot at getting a donor through normal channels, or they don't fit the right model because of lifestyle or genetics. Those people, if they have the money, will try literally anything. The more desperate the patient, the fewer questions they ask. Most have some idea there's criminality involved, but if it's that or death, then the thought of prison isn't so daunting. If it's that well-financed and professional, they should have been able to find a better method of disposing of the body than dumping this boy on the street, Kalanak said. Not on the street, in a building site. Perhaps they were planning for him to be concreted in, then got disturbed. Jean-Paul stripped off his gloves as he stepped away from the body. These people get other people to do the dirty work. Hired thugs. They were probably paid to dispose of the body securely, but got lazy, or thought they were being observed and just ditched him the first chance they had. That doesn't explain what a twenty-year-old from Scotland is doing here. It would have been quicker and less risky to have abducted someone locally, Kalanak said. Maybe he was a good match for one particular donor, and they decided to harvest everything else that was usable to justify bringing him over, the pathologist suggested. You should have your Scottish colleagues gather all his medical and personal information, anything that might have made him a target. Of course, Kalanach agreed. Knowing that meant having to contact DCI Ava Turner, wanting to, and wishing he didn't have to at the same time. He and Ava had been dancing around the edges of a relationship for a couple of years. Just when it had finally seemed about to start, he'd screwed up, and Ava had lost faith in him. Since then, they'd barely spoken. Now a phone call was inevitable. An international abduction and a death under these circumstances meant she would want to visit the victim's family personally. You coming? Jean-Paul asked from the doorway. Kalanak hadn't even noticed him moving across the room. Sure, he said, taking one last look at Malcolm Riley's incomplete face and catching an odour on the waft of air conditioning. Can you smell that? he asked the pathologist. The two of them bent over the body, breathing deeply. The top notes were all gassy, sulphur and rot, with the metallic twang of old blood. But then came something earthier, nutty with a hint of spice. All I'm getting above the normal odours is latex, and we don't use that in our gloves, the pathologist said. I agree, there's something unusual. Kalanak started to sniff around Malcolm's face, moving around to the crown of his hair, putting his nose as close to the hair as he dared without risking contamination. It's strongest here, he said. The pathologist took his place and breathed in deeply. I'm not sure what that is. I'll swab the hairs again to see if we can trace any chemicals. Can you keep the body sealed in an airtight container? so we don't lose the smell, and we'll arrange for an aromacologist to come in and see what they pick up, Kalanach asked. No problem. That was a good call. I'm very careful about using my sense of smell during postmortems, but I missed that one. Can you have the expert here within the next 24 hours? The scent will begin to fade if we leave it longer than that. Kalanach looked to Jean-Paul for confirmation. Interpol wasn't his to make demands of any more. Everything he needed had to be assessed and confirmed by someone else. Jean-Paul nodded, then looked at his watch. We should go, Jean-Paul said. Kalanak said goodbye to the pathologist and followed Jean-Paul to the car, trailing a few paces behind the man who had once been his closest friend, in and out of work, who had travelled with him, got drunk and partied with him, and who had unintentionally set him up on a date with a woman who later falsely accused him of rape. His reputation in tatters and his career at Interpol crushed, notwithstanding the fact that the case had never gone to trial, Kalanach had left France and made a new start in his father's home country, Scotland. Jean-Paul had disappeared from his life when Kalanach had needed him most.
ensuring the stain of potential guilt hadn't rubbed off on him by association. Since he'd left France, they'd spoken only once about a case, managing polite professionalism, but nothing more, the gulf between them unbridged. Still top of your game then, Luke, Jean-Paul muttered, as he climbed into the driver's seat of his old Maserati, handed down from his father, as Kalanach recalled. Jean-Paul had always found it an excellent way to attract women's attention, a certain type of woman anyway. It wasn't a judgment. In his twenties, Kalanach had regarded almost every part of his life as disposable. Women had shifted in and out of his life like a tide. These days the opposite was true. Every decision he made was measured and careful, and he was an expert on consequences. Just luck, Kalanach replied, pulling a Galois cigarette from the pouch in his pocket and dragging on it, unlit tasting bonfires and sunsets, and a thousand different red wines. He didn't bother lighting it. Smoking, like so many other pleasures, was one he had to forgo these days. His move from France to Scotland had prompted a number of changes. Giving up smoking was the most public one. Away from work, he drank less wine and spent more time at the gym. But the real change since the rape allegation was his post-traumatic impotence. That one was proving much harder to come to terms with. It was never luck with you, Jean-Paul said, pulling away roughly from the curb. You were always in the right place at the right time. You always overheld exactly the phrase we needed for all the pieces to fall into place. I often wondered if moving to Scotland had changed you. Apparently not. Kalanach stared at his former friend's face as he drove. His chin had slackened, and there was grey showing prematurely in his muddy blonde hair. Jean-Paul had aged considerably since they'd last seen one another, his mid-thirties proving unkind. Let's not do this, Kalanach said. Do what? Jean-Paul laughed. Be honest with each other. Be real. You've barely said a word to me since you came back to Interpol. Are we supposed to act like we don't know one another? Or polite bullshit and small talk? Screw that. What is it you're angry about, Jean-Paul? Kalanach asked, winding down the window and letting the weak sun warm his arm. Jean-Paul laughed, but his face was all bitter aftertaste. You think I'm angry? Jesus, Luke, are you ever going to forgive me for what happened? Astrid Bord is dead. You watched her die. I know you went through some bad shit, but the woman who accused you of rape is gone. It's time to move on. I have, Kalanach said quietly. Like fuck you have. You know what? I messed up. I didn't know what to do when Astrid accused you, but I've said sorry. You think I haven't spent the last couple of years regretting what happened? Jean-Paul, Astrid Bord played me, and you, even my mother. She was smart, devious, and the evidence she set me up with was overwhelming. Was I angry that you seemed to dump me? Damn right I was, for a long time, too. But hindsight's no bad thing. If a woman you'd been out on a date with turned up with bruises... Scratches, internal injuries for fuck's sake, and you'd lied about what had happened on your date, I'd have done exactly what you did. It's important to believe victims, even when the accused is a friend. You did the right thing. I'm not angry with you. I'm just sick of thinking about it, of it being part of my life. That's why I left Lyon and Interpol, only now I've been sent back. It wasn't my choice. I'm not trying to punish you. It's just isn't where I want to be. Well, so, you just, what, rose above it all? Slamming a foot on the brake pedal, Jean-Paul pulled the car roughly in towards the pavement. You decided to forgive me. I guess you expect me to thank you for that. God, you're unbelievable. Do you ever fuck up? It took about ten minutes after you were back at Interpol to have every woman in the place fawning over you. 
Did you know they found photos of you on the internet from when you were modeling? And the false rape allegation has just made you even more of a hero. All you went through, and you've come back stronger than ever, and now twice as magnanimous. Do you need to sleep, or are you actually superhuman? Kalanak knew what women thought of him. His looks were as much a curse as a blessing. Dark hair that curled as soon as it grew more than a couple of centimetres. Olive skin that tanned with the slightest hint of sunshine. And a smile that could persuade women to do almost anything he wanted. Not that he wanted anything from women anymore. What's going on with you? You were never like this, Jean-Paul. As for the way I'm being treated within Interpol, I haven't noticed anyone paying me any attention. A lot of the faces have changed from a couple of years ago. I just want to be left alone to get on with my job. I didn't ask to be partnered with you on this. No, you didn't. I asked to head up the investigation when I realized you were being assigned to it as Scottish liaison officer. I thought that maybe we could reconnect, put the past behind us. I don't know what I was expecting, Luke. Anger, maybe. Some bitterness. I was hoping I could help you through the transition to living in France again. I'm not living in France again, Kalanak said. I'm visiting. You're not visiting. It's as if you're not here at all. I knew you better than anyone, but I don't know the man you've turned into. It's like you're a ghost. You don't talk to anyone. You sit silently in meetings. You work, go to the gym, and disappear off to wherever you're staying. If you want to punish all your old friends, then go ahead. But did you ever stop to think that we suffered too? How you suffered? Is that a joke? Yeah, that's right. It was hilarious being the best friend of the guy awaiting trial on a rape charge. No one knew what to say to me. Half the squad stopped talking to me altogether. Astrid told everyone that I'd introduced you to her. I made it sound as if I set the whole situation up, and you just disappeared. You wouldn't take any calls. You refused visitors. You were a potential witness. My lawyer told me not to see you under any circumstances. Look, I was your best friend. You didn't rape that woman any more than I did, and I knew it. You just never gave me a chance to say those words to you, Jean-Paul shouted. You're right. I'm sorry. I should have been more thoughtful when I was facing the prospect of spending 15 years behind bars, then living with the label of sex offender and doing casual labor because my career had been stolen from me. It was a lot to deal with, Kalanach replied. Quietly. Even now, you can't see it from anyone's perspective but your own, can you? Kalanach stared at him, arms folded. One side of his mouth twisted up, half smile, half grimace. Well, now you've said everything you wanted to. I've heard your side of the story. And I'm not superhuman. I'm just doing my job. As for women paying me attention... I think you're a lot more interested in that than I am. Maybe you need to figure out why that is. You always did hate the way women reacted to me. At least you're finally being honest about it. But I'm here to work, and that's all. I want to find Malcolm Riley's killer. Close down this human trafficking case and go home. No drama, no conflict, no amateur psychotherapy, and... In the unlikely event that anyone does ask if I'm single and available, the answer is no. I'm committed elsewhere. Now, I'm pretty sure we were headed towards a crime scene. So let's go. Chapter 4 Detective Chief Inspector Ava Turner's first thought of the morning was that sex was simpler in the anticipatory stage than in the ramifications phase. Staring at the shoulders of the man asleep next to her, her second was to wonder how he ever found shirts to fit. He awoke, stretched, sighed heavily, and ran one hand through his long hair before rolling over to greet her with a wide smile. 
tell me it isn't time to get up yet, he said. I need at least another twelve hours with you before I'm prepared to let you out of bed. That's nice, she said, sitting up and wrapping his discarded shirt around herself until she located something more appropriate. But I have to get to the station, and I'm no good with early morning company, so if you could... Get out? D.I. Pax Graham asked. Ava, we both knew this was going to be complicated when we came back here last night. So let's go easy on one another. I've got no intention of making this difficult for you at work. I'm not the enemy. Far from it. All I want is to make this happen between us, on whatever terms you can deal with. He reached out and took her fingers in his hand, stroking her palm gently with his thumb. Fuck, Ava thought. Fuck, fuck, fuck. And one more for good luck. She was such an idiot. Sleeping with an officer under her command was stupid enough, but choosing one who seemed to genuinely care for her was a recipe for disaster. And that was before she pulled back the psychological curtain to take a look at her motivation. This was a mistake, Ava said, voice soft, face as neutral as she could make it. My mistake, not yours. I'm really sorry. It was a combination of having some downtime and too much beer. Not that I needed to be drunk to sleep with you. I've been out of a relationship a long time, and I suppose I got lonely. That wasn't the truth, and she knew it. But the lie was easier. You know, you're allowed to be lonely. He sat up, showing off the sort of chest an MME fighter would be proud of, and leaned over to kiss her bare shoulder. Being a detective chief inspector doesn't mean your feelings have to get shoved into some lesser status. Also, if I leave now, I wouldn't be able to impress you with my bacon sandwiches. Could I maybe take a rain check on the bacon? Ava asked. Not that it doesn't sound good. Her mobile ringtone burst through the excuse session. She grabbed it and stood, pulling the shirt fully closed, hating her self-consciousness in the cold light of day. Opening a drawer with her free hand, she rummaged for underwear and socks as she answered. Tana! Mum! Detective Sergeant Tripp said. We've caught a dead body. Single gunshot wound to the head. Deceased is a Caucasian man believed to be in his sixties. Where? Ava asked, perching on the edge of her bed to pull on knickers as she motioned at Graham to keep quiet. Dumbrydon Gardens, Wester Hills. The crime scene examiner's already there. The deputy pathologist's on his way, as Dr. Lambert is away on a lecture tour this month. Uniforms have sealed off the roads locally. Can you come? Only I've tried D.I. Graham, but it's his day off and he's not answering his phone. Ava walked around the bed, picked up Graham's jeans, reached in the pocket for his mobile and tossed it onto the bed next to him. Try his mobile again. He was probably sleeping. It's only... She checked the bedside clock. God, I overslept. How is it 8.30? I'll be with you in half an hour. Ask the I. Graham to meet me there and keep the scene secure. It's not the easiest of patches on a good day. She ended the call. Your phone was off. Trip's about to call you. We need to go in separate cars. Can you drop me back to mine on the way? Graham asked, standing up and giving Ava the benefit of all six foot four of him stark naked. She looked away, wondering what would be a good alternative career for her when she got fired from the major investigation team. Graham's mobile rang. Ava's followed suit. She walked into the bathroom to avoid anyone overhearing their voices on their respective calls. No, it's fine, I've got no plans, so I'll be there, Graham was saying, as she pushed the door half shut. This is Turner. Ava, it's Luke. She opened her mouth to talk, catching sight of herself in the bathroom mirror, socks in one hand. Mobile in the other, hair wild, mascara smudged beneath her eyes, skinnier than she'd been for years. It wasn't a flattering look. She didn't recommend a diet based solely on stress and insomnia. Can you hear me? Kalanach asked. Yes. Yes, I can. Sorry, you caught me at a busy moment. A sheen of sweat suddenly glimmered on her forehead. Shall I call back later? This can wait an hour or so. Where are you? Ava coughed and forced some authority into her voice. At home, but I'm just on my way to an incident. 
Go ahead, Trip's covering it, so I've got two minutes. You're at home. I thought I heard Pax Graham's voice before. Kalanach sounded distant, foreign. But then he was both things, Ava thought. He stopped to pick me up en route to the scene. Ava thought on her feet, feeling sick, hating the ridiculous sense that she'd been caught cheating. Ridiculous, given that she was single, even if things with Luke hadn't been properly resolved. It's a shooting, so all hands on deck. MIT went out for drinks last night and I left my car at the station. Is there an update on the trafficking case from your end? She asked, moving the conversation onto safer ground, wishing for the tenth time in as many minutes that she'd stuck to beer and not chased it with shots, and that she'd equally stuck to dull celibacy instead of trying to distract herself from the memory of the near miss with Luke by filling her bed with a convenient warm body. She'd broken her self-imposed rules pretty impressively. Drinking with her team was supposed to be limited to one quick glass, then head for the exit. No, this relates to a Police Scotland missing persons case, Edinburgh area. Young man by the name of Malcolm Riley. His DNA was put on the Interpol database two months ago. A body was found, and we've only just had official confirmation that the DNA is a match. It's a definite homicide. I'm sending an encrypted email with the details. Okay, I have DS Lively take a look at it. It'll have to be you, Eva. It's a bad one. Interpol has been asked to assist local French officers. It appears to be an organ harvesting case. The victim's been pretty much emptied out, anatomically speaking. Ava sat down on the edge of the bath and ran a hand over her eyes. You need me to go and interview the family, she said softly. I'm afraid so. I'll send you all the details. We'll need Morcombe's medical records, and we're chasing known suspects from our end. When we have any potential names, we'll cross-check to see if anyone was in the UK at the time the victim was abducted. OK. I'll send uniformed officers in advance to break the news and offer support. Then I'll get on it later this morning. Give me an hour to check on the shooting, then I'll head directly into the station and take a look. Sorry to land this on you. Sounds like you're busy enough already, Kalanak said. Until a few minutes ago, we were almost having a quiet period. She paused. How are you doing? Fine. Good, that's good. Well, I'll call if I have any questions once I'm up to speed. Jean-Paul would like a conference call. Tomorrow morning, preferably, is 9 a.m. okay with you? The bathroom door opened. Hey, Eva, we'd better... Shit, sorry. Pax Graham exited quietly. Eva cursed inside her head. The I. Graham's calling you Eva now. You've been calling me Eva since we met, Luke. When we met, you and I was the same rank. Ava tried to formulate a response, and failed. We should probably talk, sometime, about things. Things, Ava thought. As if dead bodies, trafficked women, and the ocean between them weren't enough. Talking about things meant acknowledging the fact that for two years they'd pretended to be just friends when there had always been something more than that beneath the surface. Then at the moment it had been about to become something tangible, everything had gone horribly wrong. She hadn't sent Kalanach away exactly, but the request for a Scottish liaison officer to work with Interpol had been good timing. Ava asked herself, for perhaps the millionth time, if in different circumstances she'd still have chosen Kalanach to go. She knew better than anyone how hard it was for him to go back to France after everything he'd been through. For a while, she'd persuaded herself that forcing him to return was in his best interests, that everyone had to face their demons at some point. Of course, Kalanach facing his had meant that she'd been able to delay facing hers. Successful relationships had eluded her all her adult life. There had been a brief engagement a while ago, to another police officer, who had turned out to be less than charming. There were the odd random flings over the years, but nothing that had lasted beyond the magic make-or-break six-month mark. Then there was Kalanach. 
and in spite of waiting for the right moment and making sure it was real, somehow it had all ended in pain, regret, and devastation for them both. Not all of it was his fault, either. Ava had taken a long, hard look into the face of potential hurt, failure, letdown, and chosen to sever whatever affection lay between them, irrevocably. The man she'd woken up with this morning was simply her way of decorating her very own poisoned chalice with an extra cherry. Well done, her. Ivo? Kalanach prompted. Yeah, sorry, I was checking my diary. Sounds like we're both going to be too busy to do any talking in the near future. Let's leave it until we're in the same country. Of course. His voice was abrupt. I should let you go. Don't worry about the conference call. We'll exchange details by email. Tell Pax I said hi. He was gone. Ava closed her eyes while her hands stopped shaking. She had to get a grip. Malcolm Riley's family needed her. Whichever poor soul was lying in a pool of his own blood and brains over at Dumbryden Gardens needed her. Her personal screw-ups were just going to have to take second place. Like always. Chapter 5 Ava stared through the hole in the glass pane at the crumpled body on the floor. The bullet entry wound was clear, as was the fact that the victim had been standing right next to a wall that had caught every fragment of bone, blood and grey matter expelled under bullet force from the exit wound. Did the bullet go through the glass? Ava called inside to the technician who was busy collecting fragments from various kitchen surfaces. Unlikely. We suspect something much larger and more blunt, given the size of the hole in the pane. Ava opened the back door of the terraced house cautiously, careful to sidestep any glass on the floor. Only there wasn't any. Have you already swept up the glass for forensic testing? She checked. No, nothing's been moved from the scene yet. We need everything in place to track the likely journey through the property. Do we have an estimate for time of death? Ava asked, checking her watch. Six to seven hours ago. Thanks, Ava murmured, as she made her way further inside, mindful that it had to be scene examiners first and police officers second to avoid contamination. Stealing a glance at the victim, scrawny, neck covered in what looked like jailhouse tattoos, she left the kitchen and went into the lounge. Hand-rolled cigarette ends overflowed from every conceivable container, and a few had missed, judging by the blackened holes in both the furniture and carpet. Takeaway cartons were strewn liberally about. A yellowing sofa that had obviously been chewed by a dog at some stage sat sadly at one end of the room, collapsing in the centre. It looked embarrassed to be there, Ava thought. Rightly so. The whole place stank. An old vest had been used to soak up some sort of spillage on a cardboard box that was doubling as a coffee table, and the curtains were makeshift scraps of material hung with gaffer tape. Ava took the stairs, aware of the carpet sticking to her shoe coverings, glad of the gloves she was wearing that protected her hands from contamination as much as protected the scene from her. Straight ahead was a bathroom she didn't even dare enter. The stench coming from it was nauseating. The first box-room bedroom was jam-packed with bits of broken furniture and old suitcases. Beyond that lay the other bedroom, housing an equal number of cigarette butts as the lounge, and a bed with sheets that might never have been changed. No curtains at all upstairs, and no clothes in the open wardrobe. What clothes there were had ended up scattered across the floor in varying piles of slightly worn to absolutely filthy. Next to the bed was a pile of red-inked bills. Ava picked one up and opened it. Apparently, Mr. Jean Oldman hadn't been meeting his electricity payments. She looked around. It was a tip. Every surface in the entire house was dusty or sticky. Except one. Ava took the stairs back down, two at a time. Everyone stay still, she ordered. Wherever you are, the kitchen floor's clean. Mom? Tripp queried, staring at her from the hallway. 
every other surface in this entire house is a bacteria brothel. There's a man lying in the corner of the kitchen with his brains marking the walls. No effort to clean that up, and yet the kitchen floor is absolutely spotless. Somebody cleaned it, so whatever was on there was more important to the killer than the body itself. I need a complete window blackout and luminal spray asap. One of the scene examiners shouted. If the surface was bleached and the victim's been dead seven hours already, whatever was on the floor will be fading fast. Ava stood back and let them work. Every window was lined with blackout blinds, and every door shut until no light could enter. Then four officers waited to spray a section of floor each. The entire floor began to glow immediately. That's the bleach. An officer explained. You were right. It's been recently cleaned, but it was fast and areas have been missed. There, he pointed in the direction of the back door, down in the corner near the skirting board, and there, photos immediately, please. A faint blue glow came from two lines of grouting, and a semicircle roughly two inches across could be seen clearly near the back wall, furthest from the door. Why does it glow blue? Eva asked. The chemicals react with the iron in the blood's hemoglobin. We're on borrowed time, though it's fading. That's why we have the cameras ready to record areas of the floor where we need to pay special attention afterwards. Eva trod carefully in the dark, moving towards the semicircle that was the boldest of all the glowing sections of the floor. It's the edge of a footprint, she said, just the back of the heel. Can we get an accurate foot size from this? Do you think? She asked the lead examiner. "I'd say there's enough definition there for that, and now we know where the blood is, we might be able to ascertain more with further testing. The fact that we're seeing this much glow probably means the bleach wasn't very strong. Any hope of getting DNA? Depends if we can find a sample unaffected by the bleach." "All right," Eva said. "The victim's name is probably Jean Oldman, the property owner." Could you double check against any other fingerprints and DNA in the property? I didn't see any photo ID lying around. She made her way outside. In other areas of the city, the presence of so many police officers would have triggered the build-up of an automatic crowd. Onlookers would be waiting for a body to be brought out on a stretcher. Speculation as to what nightmarish events had occurred would be circulating. But this was the heart of Wester Hills. When the police arrived, doors were slammed shut and curtains were closed. No one stood out on the street. A loathing of authority overrode natural curiosity. "The I Graham," she said. He was in the throes of organizing a nervous-looking bunch of uniformed officers. Conducting door to doors in that region of the city was about as much fun as a colonoscopy. "Mom," he said, face straight, no sign of what had happened the night before. He was professional and discreet, which made Ava feel worse rather than better about what she'd done. I'd like to knock on the immediate neighbors' doors myself to get a feel for what's happening. But would you do the talking? Ava asked. Years of working undercover meant Graham had developed an easy tone, which had the hardiest of potential witnesses opening up to him. In spite of her long curly hair and unthreatening physique. Her English accent, courtesy of an expensive education insisted on by her parents, rendered her something of an affront to some people, particularly in an area as deprived as Wester Hills. They knocked on the first door and waited. Not so much as one curtain twitched. Yet there was a clear sense that the property was occupied. Eva motioned to a uniformed officer to check round the back. It took no more than two minutes before a young couple were being escorted around from their back garden. They were just headed through their back gate, ma'am, the officer explained. D. I. Graham took over. Well, thanks for coming to chat. We won't keep you long. You've probably noticed activity in your neighbour's house. No response. Were either of you in last night? We went to bed early, the man said, glancing sideways at the woman. Did you? Well, it's really helpful that you were in your property. We've reason to believe there might have been a gunshot. Did you hear anything? Slept right through. Didn't hear nothing. The man declared. Is your bedroom at the front or the back of the house? 
Graham asked. The buck, the man said. So what? So that would have been above and right next to the room where we think the gun was fired, likely around 3 a.m. Are you sure you didn't wake up at all? They both shook their heads. A window was broken too. I'm guessing there'd have been quite a disturbance. Do you know your neighbour well? Not really, the man said. So you knew him a bit then, Graham said. Ava had to give him credit. He was a thousand times more patient than her. What was he like? He was a creep, the woman said. The man gave her a sharp look that Ava didn't like. How so? Graham asked. She shrugged, suddenly finding the pavement of huge interest. Her partner took over. You know what some blokes are like. Can't keep their eyes off a woman's tits when they're talking to her. That's why we never chatted to him much. Now, we didn't hear anything, we didn't see anything, so we're free to go. Graham looked at Ava, who nodded. Give your details to the uniformed officer behind you, then you can go. And if either of you should suddenly remember anything, get in touch, OK? We know not to use your names. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, the man said, putting an arm around the woman and pulling her away. It wasn't a surprise. There were areas of the city where it was understood you just didn't speak to the police. Not if you didn't want your windows smashed first and your face shortly thereafter. Life was tough. Just buying food and staying out of prison was hard enough for some people. You got a reputation as a rat and you'd be looking for somewhere new to live before you even smelled the petrol being poured through your letterbox. Let's try the other side, Ava said. The door opened before they'd knocked and a stout, elderly lady stood, hands on hips, ready to do business. Are you here about my disability, Scooter? she shouted. I'm D.I. Graham. We were wondering if you know your neighbour, Jean Oldman? I reported it missing two months ago. Left it outside my front door. Do you know how many police came to see me about that? I can certainly check up on what's happening with that case when I get back to the station. Could I take your name? If you haven't got my scooter, you can get off my doorstep. I've got nothing else to say to you. A bunch of kids who'd assembled behind Ava's back began giggling. She left Graham to deal with the woman who clearly had a prepared script that she was going to stick to no matter what and turned to the kids. Live round here, do you? She asked the group. There were four of them. Three boys and one girl who was trying to make herself look tougher than the company she was keeping. Shoulders back, chin stuck out. Necessary, Ava guessed, so she didn't get ditched. Gender equality wasn't a priority on Edinburgh's back streets. Fucking pig, the girl said. The boys laughed. What do you lot know about the man who lives in there? She motioned towards Jean Oldman's house. My mum says he never washed his clothes, not ever, the smallest boy said. Would you shut your gob? You know we're not supposed to talk to them, the girl warned. Is he dead? He's got to be. My dad said the police never bother with us here unless someone's dead. The boy continued. The girl dug him in the ribs. So, none of you are supposed to talk to me then, Ava said. If I was going to ask who's in charge round here, who would that be? Don't know what you mean, the girl said. Yes, you do. The person your mums and dads warn you to stay clear of. Everyone either goes quiet when they walk around the corner or talks to them like they're the head teacher. Who does that sound like? Are you stupid? The girl asked. Ava looked at her. She wasn't being cheeky. There was genuine curiosity on her face. You think I should be too scared to ask? Ava directed at her, gently. Fucking right you should, the girl replied. Are you scared of him? Ava continued. You kids, get out of here. The woman D.I. Graham had been questioning stormed down her front path, waving her arms at them. Go on, you can get home right now. In the second Ava turned away to tell her to leave them alone, the kids were gone. 
sprinting along the pathway between the terrace of houses and a tenement block. I'll look into the problem with your scooter, Graham told her as he approached Ava. Don't bother, the woman said. I just remembered. I sold it last month. She waddled back inside, slamming her front door. Nothing? Ava asked him. I learned a few new words, Graham said, which is impressive, given how much time I've spent undercover with drug dealers and gangs. What next? I'm going into the station, Ava said. I'll follow you in. Now, don't worry, it's your rest day. We won't get much further until the post-mortem's been done and we've got the forensics report. We sure as hell aren't going to get anything useful from local witnesses. I'd like to come in and help, Graham said. And you could use some breakfast. She began walking towards her car. He fell into step beside her. Listen, Pax, last night was... a one-off. It can't happen again. It makes things too complicated at work. I hear you, Graham said. But you should know that I've never given up on anything I really wanted in my life. I'm not an achievable goal. Also, I'm not worth the effort. I don't do healthy relationships. I guess I'm asking you to forget what happened between us. Would you try to do that? He dug his hands deep into his pockets, head to one side, his long hair moving in the breeze, jaw flexing. You're not particularly forgettable, I'm afraid, he said eventually, smiling before turning slowly and walking away. Ava searched for an expletive that would adequately give voice to her frustration and failed to find one. Chapter 6 A building site, just off Rue Curial, at the side of a hotel whose star rating Kalanach estimated to be in the negatives, was where Malcolm Riley's body had been dumped, and it was about as far from the image of romantic, starlit Paris as it was possible to get. No building work had taken place there for several weeks, while the builders settled disputes over safety regulations. So Malcolm had lain face down between a cement mixer and a cherry picker until some unfortunate labourer, who couldn't possibly have been paid enough to have discovered a hollowed-out body, had turned up on a routine safety hazard walk-around one day, only to have the site immediately closed down again as a crime scene. Kalanach looked around. There was some regeneration happening in the area, but he guessed that was only because land in that district was so cheap. Low-cost modern flats rose above lockups that harboured decades-old secrets. Cracks in walls were papered over with plaster, and alleyways led into dark places that no sensible person would enter. This was not the Paris of tourist fantasies. It was a world riddled with debt and a multitude of illegal ways to pay it off. This was a space where a body could rot and no one would notice, or care if they did. A tarpaulin shielded the patch where Malcolm's body had lain. Beneath it, a brown stain marked the concrete and brick rubble. Was he naked when he was found? Kalanach asked John Paul. Wrapped in a plastic sheet. We are assuming he was left here at night to avoid witnesses. He was there for several days before the corpse was found. Did you speak to your boss about getting his medical records? It's in hand. So how did they get access to the building site? They forced open two sections of wooden paneling and walked in. Dragged the body across the site. There was a build-up of rubble around the plastic sheet. Left him, then put the panel back in place. We know from the construction company that building work was behind schedule, though. It's possible they'd planned to dump him in a foundation pit, ready to be cemented over, but their timing was off. Fingerprints on the sheet? None. All the DNA belongs to the victim. The only unusual chemical identified was lanolin, and that was in quantities found only by swabbing the sheet, not large patches or smears, nothing visible to the naked eye. Lanolin's from sheep's wool, right? Kalanach asked. Yes. We're compiling a list of possible sources, farms, animal movement vehicles, textile factories. 
Kalanak looked upwards, checking which buildings had aspects that overlooked the building site. And all these properties have been canvassed to check if they saw anything suspicious. As much as we could. We'd have needed twenty different interpreters to get round every apartment. You know what it's like here. The police are the enemy. These people don't want dead bodies in their backyard any more than anyone else, Kalanak said. A brick whistled past Kalanak's head and smashed at his feet. He leapt away and dived towards a cherry picker for cover as another hit Jean Paul on the knee. Clutching his leg, Jean Paul limped towards a half built wall, crouching down with his back to the brickwork as a broken metal pipe smashed into an abandoned paint can. The projectiles were flying at them from behind the main entry gates, and the aim was accurate enough that whoever was throwing had a decent view of them. Get their attention! Kalanach shouted to Jean Paul. Just stay where you are. I'm calling for police backup. Jean Paul waved him back into the sheltered area. Don't do that. As soon as they hear sirens, they'll scatter. Just divert their attention for a minute, Kalanak said, ducking low and running towards the far end of the site, where pallets had been stacked precariously high near the boundary. Jean Paul took a few steps away from the wall, shielding his head with one arm as he bent to pick up the broken pipe, then swung it high in the air and back over the fence from the direction it had come. There was a cry, followed by a furious yell. As Kalanak allowed himself a glance over his shoulder, multiple projectiles appeared over the top of the fence. He hoisted himself up on the nearest pile of pallets, hoping they'd been stacked carefully, disliking the wobble as he rose higher. Jean-Paul yelled. Kalanak turned to check he was unharmed. His foot slipped, the pallets groaning beneath his weight, and he grabbed at the stack to his side. Splinters slid diagonally into his right palm. Fuck, he muttered, seeing Jean-Paul using a stray sheet of corrugated iron as an anti-assault umbrella. He smiled in spite of the pain in his hand and his concern for Jean-Paul. It was such a throwback to years gone by. He and Jean-Paul had travelled the world, assisting police forces from other countries to track drug cartels, arms dealers and money launderers. In situations like these had been the days they'd looked forward to. Just enough physical jeopardy to get their pulses racing, with the unshakable belief that a few hours later they'd be sitting in some bar, empty beer bottles spread like trophies, and another credit on their Interpol files. Simpler times. He hauled himself upwards, the splinters folding beneath his skin as he closed his fist, knowing he was facing a lengthy session with a needle and antiseptic later that night. The top of the fence was too thin to do anything except angle his foot onto its side to give him the boost he needed to jump. He took a literal leap of faith, hoping there wasn't too much smashed glass or jagged metal on the other side. Landing well initially, he stumbled over a half-buried paving stone, falling sideways to avoid planting his splintered hand in the dirt. He opened his eyes to stare into the empty barrel of a syringe the needle encrusted with blackened blood and pointing in the direction he needed to be going. Getting to his feet carefully, avoiding the needle that he could see, and what he presumed were several others better hidden, Kalanak rounded the edge of the fence and sprinted for the far corner. There he paused, putting his mobile in camera mode and exposing it beyond the edge of the fence, filming as he assessed the situation. Between eight and twelve young men packed into a tight group were picking up whatever they could find at their feet and lobbing it over the wooden security fence. Two others were standing with eyes pressed up to the gaps in the vertical planks, yelling instructions to the others. Middle Eastern in appearance, and speaking rapidly in a language Kalanach couldn't understand, they looked more like bored teenagers than a serious threat. Except for one who was keeping his distance watching the others, making the odd comment. Kalanach focused his camera as tightly as he could on the faces, hoping the sound recording wasn't too muffled, as he decided what to do. These were local boys. That much was clear. It was a fair bet they realised he and Jean-Paul were police officers. Calling for backup was the only way to ensure controlling the youths until each could be spoken to individually. 
but it was hard to achieve a completely silent police approach anywhere in Paris with tail-to-tail traffic. He wondered how much longer Jean-Paul could remain unhurt with so many projectiles raining down. A gunshot stopped his strategizing. The boy who'd been keeping out of the fray had apparently grown tired of the situation, aiming directly at the wooden fence and sending shrapnel flying at his mates. They leapt away, shouting as the man-boy walked forward, gone out in front towards the hole he'd created. Kalanach knew that Jean-Paul would be calling the situation in and searching for better cover. More of a problem now would be stopping the inevitable move of the gang towards the entrance Jean-Paul and he had used, thereby preventing a safe exit. He and Jean-Paul were both unarmed. Interpol agents rarely took guns out during investigations unless there was a known or specific threat. Today was supposed to be about information gathering, not engaging in an anti-police showdown. Worse than that was the prospect that a stray shot might hit an innocent passerby. There was only one thing left to do. Police! Kalanak shouted. Put down your weapons, hands up and get on your knees! The shot came in his direction before he saw the young man move. Glancing the corner of the fence and pinging away at an angle, Kalanach ducked. Feet were pounding concrete, but the high rise of flats in a square around them created an echo chamber. There was no way of knowing if the gang was running towards him or away. Kalanach bolted for a nearby doorway. There were shouts from just beyond his line of vision frantic fury mixed with questions and instructions. Kalanach forced his body back further into the recess. Footsteps indicated an approach in his direction, and he readied himself to fight. Sirens sounded in the distance, just as he was about to throw himself out of his hiding place. There was an instantaneous hush, everyone listening, trying to assess the direction from which the emergency services were coming. Then the scatter began. People running in all directions, calling to one another, their panicked voices revealing their immaturity. Less aggression, more uncertainty. Kalanach stuck his head out and watched them go. They ran at extraordinary speed, jumping railings, disappearing across the road, one leaping from a garbage can to grab a second-floor railing and haul himself up onto the exterior corridor of flats. Only one voice remained, calling listening in silence, calling again. Hasnia! A pause. Hasnia! Kalanach looked around. The caller was nowhere to be seen, and his voice was fading. The sirens were getting closer, closing in from both ends of the road. Hasnia! The shout was more insistent. A scraping noise came from behind a pile of bin bags. Kalanach crept over to take a look as Jean-Paul appeared from the far end of the building site, sporting a large graze across his cheek. He gave a thumbs up. Kalanach responded with a nod and a finger over his lips to keep him quiet. Covering the final distance to the bin bags quickly, Kalanach found a young girl, crouched, tears in her eyes, looking absolutely terrified. He smiled at her gently hands slightly raised in the international signal that no harm was intended. She looked less than convinced. He spoke in French to her, quietly, slowly, and clearly. Everything's all right. Do you speak French? There was a brief pause. Then, yes, with a sob. Are you Hasnia? She looked surprised, then relieved, nodding, young enough to believe that anyone who knew her name must be friend rather than foe. Kalanach wished life was really so black and white. He smiled gently. My name is Luke. Don't be scared. Who are you waiting for? My brother, she said, looking away to the side. Her French was good, considering her age. He guessed she was five or six years old. But then desperation was often the most compelling teacher of foreign languages. Who's your brother? Kalanach asked. Azat, 
she said quietly. Do you know him? I think he's looking for you. Are you hungry, Aznia? Kalanak asked, lowering himself to one knee to get closer to her. She frowned. Good girl, Kalanak thought. At least she'd been taught to be wary of strangers. A pair of boots appeared in his peripheral vision, scruffy, a hole in front of the big toe of one. Kalanak took his time turning round to assess their owner. The boy was in his mid-teens, but his eyes were older. He was ready to fight, ready to run, ready to do whatever he had to do. His clothes were in the same state as his boots, ragged and ill-fitting, stolen or hand-me-downs. His face and hands were bruised and darkened with a sort of dirt you couldn't really shift without soap. He and his sister were obviously living rough. Leave her alone, the boy said. His French was fluent, not just the words but the accent. Impressive for a second language. I'm not going to hurt your sister, Kalanach told him. I'm not here for you. But I have some questions about the body that was left at the building site. Do you know about that? Hasnia, come to me, he said. Kalanach took a few notes from his pocket and held them where the little girl could see them. Your sister's hungry, Kalanach said, and she needs new clothes. I just want some information. We don't need your money, Azat said. We're fine. Now get out of the way and let my sister get by. I'm not going to stop her from getting to you. You have nothing to fear from me. We're just talking. A police car roared into view. Azat pushed forward, grabbed his sister by the arm and began pulling her out from between bin bags. But I am hungry, she whined. I'll get you food. Azat said. Kalanak stepped aside to let them get past him. Where are you from originally? He asked. Afghanistan, Hasnia said. Do you have food in your pockets? Kalanak passed her a twenty euro note, keeping another in his hand but on show. Other police officers were approaching cautiously. Do you live near here? The two children stared at one another. All right, you don't have to tell me. Take my card, though. Keep it. I need to find out who brought the body that was found in this building site. Call me if you know anything. Maybe I can help you. You'll take my sister away from me. Will he? Hasnia cried. No, I won't. And I won't let anyone else, either. I can see how much you love each other. Kalanak held a hand up to the approaching officers, keeping them at bay some twenty meters away. Take this money, buy some food, and make sure you have somewhere safe to stay. If you get in trouble, call me. Azat snatched away the cash and the card, shoving them in his pocket as he and his sister began to run. Hasnia, don't let him throw my card away! Kalanak shouted after them. The girl looked back gave a half-wave, then they were gone, down an alley that was no more than a crack between buildings. Kalanak supposed he should have called family services and had them taken to a children's shelter. There was obviously no adult caring for them. They were skinny and unkempt. But there was every chance they'd be separated. It was difficult housing a young girl with a teenage boy. The psychological damage done by separating dependent siblings was enormous. They would get lost inside a system that did its best, but which too often left children sitting in the dirt at the bottom of life's slide. The truth was that maybe they were happier living rough, but together. Why didn't you bring them in? Jean-Paul demanded from behind him. Kalanach turned round. His colleague was holding a gauze pad to a bleeding wound on his head and looking shaken. He wouldn't have told us anything, Kalanach replied. He might have, if he'd thought the alternative was having his sister taken away, Jean-Paul said, tossing the gauze into a skip and setting his free hands on his hips. I wasn't prepared to do that. Yeah, we're lucky for you you're not the person who's going to have to explain to Malcolm Riley's parents how he died. Did you go soft in Scotland? Maybe I just grew up a bit, 
Kalinach said quietly, wondering where Ava was at that moment. Part of him wishing he could have been with her to give the news to Malcolm Riley's family. The other part, equally glad he wasn't. Chapter 7 Bart woke up feeling sick, rolling dramatically to his left and smashing his face against the wall. Metal screeched, and the world shifted around him, tilting forwards then back, until he lurched for the ring in the centre of the floor and held tight. The feeling of movement wasn't new. His world had been unstable since he'd first awoken, but this was something different. Almost, although he told himself it was the lack of fresh water and decent food making him delusional, like flying. The box he was trapped in shifted again, and this time it was a different noise. Whistling, a gust, and a spinning turn. He gripped his stomach, wishing it would stop. It was a desperate thing to have become resigned to dying alone in what amounted to little more than a cell. The air stank from the bucket he'd had no choice but to fill, avoiding the overflow where it had tipped twice during the journey. Despite turning off the electric lamp for increasingly lengthy periods, whenever his sanity could stand it, the battery was fading now. Alone in the dark, cold and starving, at least fear had deserted him too. There was nothing with him in the dark that could hurt him more than his own imagination, and he had conquered that. For the briefest of periods, he had managed to meditate, sitting upright, blanket wrapped around his stiff body, breathing in a rhythm with his heartbeat, imagining sitting on a beach at sunset, listening to the waves, just the waves letting nothing else in. It was a neat trick when you learned to do it well. Having an ex-girlfriend who'd been training to become a yoga instructor had helped. The effects just didn't last very long. His ribcage protested as a huge crash beneath his prone body reverberated through him. Bart realised the sensation of flying hadn't been a product of his nutritionally starved mind. Whatever container he was in had been moving through the air. No more, though. All movement, the sense of rocking, had ceased. New noises invaded his space, muffled and distant. But there were definitely voices blended in with the mechanical din beyond his walls. Bart stood up, listened, strode towards the wall and took a deep breath. Hammering on the wall, he began to shout. He bolstered the noise of his fists with one foot. When that was bloody and raw, he used a knee instead. Nothing. No response. Letting his fists rest, by now his hands resembled a cage fighter's, he took the strain with his forehead. Unfamiliar with the art of giving a Glaswegian kiss, Bart didn't let himself be deterred. He headbutted the wall as if his life depended on it, mainly because by then... He'd realised that it did. He would die inside that box if something didn't happen soon. Slamming his forehead into the wall three, four, five times, he went reeling backwards, losing his balance and ending up back on the floor. On his knees he went for the wall again. The electric lantern finally gave up the ghost. In the perfect dark he hammered, shouting, yelling, screaming, until his voice was nothing more than a whisper. Then an engine started up, and everything started moving again. Bart lay down and let defeat shrivel him into submission. It was impossible to know how long the journey had taken. Bart had either slept or passed out. His head was thumping, and there was blood crusted on his forehead and down his cheeks. The memory was vague, but at some point his body had assumed control of his brain and apparently tried to break through the walls. He was paying for it now. Bart tried to stand and failed. From the far end of his prison box came the squeal of metal, then something else, and for a moment he couldn't identify the change. The quality of the blackness changed. Not dramatically. No one switched on a light, but there was a new duskiness to the dark shifting from black to the deepest of greys. Particles of light were invading his atmosphere. 
he'd assumed the space was completely sealed. Not so. Crawling on hands and knees, he made for the wall closest to the noise. Open it up, a man shouted. Someone answered with an accent Bart recognised as French, even if he couldn't speak the language. He stared at the walls, as if by concentrating hard enough he would be able to see the faces that lay beyond. Were these his rescuers? His assailants? Raising one bruised and shaking hand, he paused before knocking. He had no idea how long he'd been trapped inside. Days, he assumed, but already his prison felt safer than the unknown beyond. In the outside world, he'd been kidnapped and removed from everything and everyone he loved. He had no idea why or by whom. He'd never expected to fall victim to such evil. Now, it was all he could think about. Every face he saw would be a mask, every word a lie. He would never be able to trust anyone again. A scraping, crunching came from one upper corner of the cell before Bart found his courage. He backed away. The first, clear light pierced the gloom to reveal a scene that had him cringing with embarrassment, in spite of the horrors he'd endured. A blast of fresh air only served to intensify the stench of human waste that Bart had become used to. But now he could see it. The bucket he'd been using had overflowed with the journey and the floor was awash. He held his filthy hands in front of his face. Now he could smell himself, too, and felt a desperate urge to vomit as the end of his prison was crowbarred away to the sound of ripping wood. Beyond the opening, it was too bright for his eyes to focus. Help me, he whispered. Pick him up, a man said. Heavy boots crossed the wooden cell. Two men took an arm each in gloved hands, dragging him out into the daylight. Bart breathed deeply. His eyes closed, feeling weak sunlight on his face and doing his best to muster some strength in his legs. His eyes were taking their time adjusting to the brightness. After a few steps, the men lowered him to the ground and he sank gratefully to his knees. An open bottle was thrust into his hands. He sniffed it registered nothing but cold water and swallowed the bottle in one go. A car park appeared in blurred patches. A few vans, gravel, brown grass around the edges. No buildings in sight. Nothing that gave him any indication where he was. Behind him, on the back of a massive lorry, was a cargo container. He blinked, made an effort to keep down the water and rubbed his sleeve over his eyes. Inside the container was a thick-walled wooden cell. The end wall prized off. A second bottle of water was handed to him. Slowly, a man said. Then eat. A loaf of bread and a tatty brown paper bag was thrown down to him. The tone and the treatment were all the confirmation needed of his status. His vision was clear now, as was his sense of smell. He stank. Not like he imagined a human who'd been incarcerated would, but like an animal. All filth and sweat. The sort of smell found in farms and abattoirs. The men around him seemed not to notice. They weren't surprised by the state of him, which meant they'd done it before. He grabbed the bread, which looked like a gourmet offering compared to the box of stale snacks that had been left in the container for him. Even so, he'd consumed it all early in the journey and had been left desperate for more. Once you realised what true hunger was, seizing food, no matter what position you were in, was more instinct than choice. As he ate, men wandered into his former home with buckets. The sound of sloshing water hit the floor, and streams of filth ran out. Another brought several heavy-duty plastic cartons from the back of a van, with boxes of what must have been food supplies, similar to those he'd found. I can't go back in there, he told the man closest to him, through a mouthful of bread. Can't do it. The man ignored him and barked orders to others, tapping on his watch. Faster movement followed, guns were drawn, and men approached the backs of two vans. Head down, Bart was ordered. When his reaction time wasn't fast enough, he was assisted with a slap to the back of his scalp. 
He kept his head angled down, but his eyes up. The van doors opened slowly. The men reached in, pulling out the occupants of the vehicles. One by one, women appeared, hands tied, moving slowly, blinking at the sudden change in environment. Their faces were dirty and their clothes shabby. But they weren't in the same dreadful state as Bart. Not yet. But then they were ushered towards the container. One woman began to cry and it spread through them like a virus, the women either side succumbing to tears, another going straight into a wailing sound as if she'd only been waiting for a prompt. Bart kept count. Four women from one van, five more from another. He hoped for their sakes that they were given several more buckets for the journey. One woman fell to her knees, then let herself go to the floor face first, sobbing, begging in the universal language of terror and desperation. A guard gave her an order. She didn't move. That earned her a kick. She reached out for the man's ankle, grabbing it, pulling herself towards his feet. He leaned down, snatching a bunch of her already matted hair, wrenching her face upwards to look into his eyes. He spat, waved the gun in her face. She sobbed some more. Bart wanted to say something. In the dim recesses of his mind, he imagined a braver man, a stronger male specimen who had not been so broken by his ordeal springing up, wrestling a gun from one of the men, shooting off a couple of bullets to show he meant business before taking command of the situation and freeing them all. What he did was let his face fall to the dirt. What he didn't see couldn't hurt him. Instead, he heard all he needed. In spite of the constant mechanical noise of the previous days, he wasn't quite sure of the time period. His ears were alert as ever. He had another kick. That soft whoosh of air as foot contacted stomach. More crying. Laughter. Another man's footfall, heavy, slow, deliberate. Then the unmistakable sound of a zip being lowered. Liquid hitting skin in a constant stream. The woman let out a howl that was end-game hopelessness. The reduction to nothing more than disposable goods was complete. As Bart opened his eyes, the woman was crawling away through the dirt, following the others into the black hole that he'd just escaped. The men picked up the wooden end wall of the cell, took nails from their pockets, gathered hammers, and began to seal it up. The hammering from the outside was matched blow for blow by the sound of fists hitting the inside of the wood. Bart had time to wonder if the men had bothered to replace the batteries inside the lamp. As pathetic as it was, that tiny spark had been everything to him in the endless dark. He looked past the man standing over him. I need to pee, he said. Where do I go? The bottles of water had run through him like fresh rain off dried mud. The man pointed at the ground where Bart sat. He was going nowhere. If he needed to piss, it was right there or not at all. He did what he needed, watching as the enormous container door was swung shut. A wooden cell within a metal prison. Enough noise externally that no one would ever be heard within. He wished vaguely that he hadn't bothered ripping his vocal cords to shreds for nothing. With one hand taking care of business, he used the other to dip into the rear pocket of his jeans clutching his most treasured possession. Loath to sacrifice it, but who knew where he might end up next? If this was his only chance to leave a note, a record of his passing, then he had no choice. He waited until all eyes were elsewhere, then dropped the photo of his father behind him in the dirt as he zipped up his jeans. Ten minutes later, and the container was gone, driven away on the back of a lorry by three of the men. Two others climbed into the unmarked white van from which the women had disembarked, leaving one final van and a car. The women were obviously being trafficked, presumably for sexual exploitation or into slavery. What he had no understanding about whatsoever was why he was there. He figured he would find out soon enough, and the answer wasn't going to be one he wanted to hear, so he just didn't ask. He wondered what the men thought of him, on his knees between a puddle of his own urine and a stream of someone else's, not even asking for his freedom, not begging, 
not trying to run, just doing nothing. His life had gone from hopes and dreams to a nightmare in such a short time frame that his head was spinning with it. Just survive for the next five minutes, he thought. After that, I'll worry about another five. If I make it to tonight, I'll worry about the morning. The bread sat in a hard lump in his stomach. He would comply. There was no point annoying his captors. He would watch and learn. Information, he heard his father say inside his head. You can't run if you don't know where you're running to. You can't fight if you don't know your enemy's strengths. And you can't do anything at all dehydrated and starving. Eat and drink whatever they offer, Bart told himself. Sleep when it's safe. Don't hope. Plan. Car, one of the men said. Now. Bart stood up and stretched. More water? he asked. The men looked at one another until someone shrugged and reached into the van, throwing another bottle in Bart's direction. Piss in my car and I'll cut your dick off, he was warned. Turn round. He was marched to the boot of the car and told to climb in. The floor was covered in old blankets that smelled of dog. He was given a moment to take another drink before his hands were tied behind his back. I hear you bang or shout. I pull over and fucking gut you. Get in. Bart did as he was told. The container lorry had headed north, as far as he could tell from the position of the sun and the fact that the day was still warm with some hours of sunlight to go. The car was pointed in the other direction. It was a straightforward exchange then. Made sense. Why pay for a container if it only held goods to trade in one direction? Two or three of the men had spoken French to each other. His journey, while it had seemed endless, could only have been a couple of days. France seemed like the logical point for them to have docked in that timescale. The women had spoken a language he hadn't recognised, though. A couple of them had been very dark-skinned, but the majority looked more Eastern European. Either they'd been kidnapped, or they'd thought they'd found a passport to a new and better life. That was almost crueler. Paying their captors for the prospect of safe passage and finding the opposite. Their families left to wonder what had happened to them, and why they never contacted them again. It made Bart think of his own mother. She, at least, would have called the police by now. People would be looking for him, retracing his last known steps. His friends would be plaguing social media with requests for shares and information. Somewhere, someone had to have seen something that could lead to him. The woman he'd dated twice, if meeting for coffee could be considered a date, had offered him a lift home from the restaurant. Her name had been Kitty. Or maybe she'd said it was a nickname. They hadn't progressed to surnames. That was as much as he could recall. There was no CCTV in the main restaurant dining room, but there was a camera on one of the doors to capture images of any diners who decided that paying for their meal was not a good option. Would Kitty have thought of that? Perhaps she'd worn a wig, or changed her face with makeup. Even he couldn't quite reconstruct her in his mind. His poor mother. She would be frantic. That was a good thing in the circumstances. She wouldn't rest until he was found. The car started up, and he jammed his feet to keep from rolling around and hurting himself. Steady, he told himself. Don't get injured. He tried to focus on the distance they travelled. He tried to figure out the left and right turns and to create a map in his mind. But it was warm. The car rocked gently, and the stinking blankets were a soft enough bed and he was exhausted. When Bart woke up, the first thing he saw was a chain-link fence. Chapter 8 Indrane Desai was waiting in Jean-Paul's office, currently also Kalanach's desk space, at 7.30am, wearing a traditional sari and spaghetti-strap gold sandals. Jean-Paul took the seat nearest her, offering drinks that she refused, and his hand that she also opted not to shake. Kalanach watched Jean-Paul look at her admiringly. His old colleague had never had much of a poker face when it came to women. 
Forgive me if it seems rude, but I try not to transfer any oils onto my own skin. Sometimes a residue of scent can throw me off when I'm working, she explained. You've been to see Malcolm Riley's body, Kalanach asked. I have, she nodded. Not a normal part of my job. Aromacologists design scents for shops and supermarkets. Sometimes I work with athletes putting together aromatherapy packages for them. That was the first time I've worked on a dead body, and even though I only saw the head uncovered, it was awful. I'm sorry, Jean-Paul said. It's the worst part of what we do. I know it was an unusual request for you to smell his hair. Were you able to pick anything up? I was, Indrani confirmed. He was in a sealed bag, so when the plastic was first opened, I caught a strong whiff. It disappeared in minutes, though. I'm afraid it wouldn't pass a scientific test if you were looking for me to give evidence in court. At the moment, we just need whatever leads we can get, Kalanak said. What was your conclusion? Myrrh. Burned near to his head. The smell was smoky and slightly impure, but myrrh itself has a very specific licorice note to it. Earthy and rich, but with a contrasting lemon scent. Some people say they smell latex, too. It's quite unique. I'm surprised you picked it up given all the chemical odors in the mortuary, she told Kalanach. Sorry, how did you know it was me? he asked. The pathologist described you to me. He said you were the one with the symmetrical face. Yes, well, Detective Inspector Kalanach gets a lot of that, Jean-Paul snapped. Could you tell us where someone might get hold of Murr? and what it might have been used for. He gave Kalanach a look that was a throwback to days Kalanach was happier and not remembering, when they'd spent weekends and holidays partying together, and women had been their constant companions. Indrani Desai was far from the first woman Jean-Paul had been attracted to, who had seemed more interested in Kalanach. In their younger days, it had been a source of simple ribbing. Now it seemed Jean-Paul didn't find it quite so amusing. Kalanach himself wasn't the slightest bit interested. He was only there for Malcolm Riley. It can be anything from just making a place smell good to a belief that myrrh is an antioxidant. It's from a tree sap. There are all sorts of claims made about its medical properties, including a treatment for arthritis, neuropathic pain for asthma, and indigestion. It's generally regarded as being purifying and cleansing. Certainly it has antiseptic properties. It can also be used for embalming. Historically, it's been used for centuries as part of rituals. You know the Bible reference, obviously, but most cultures have used myrrh at some point. Today you find it in candles or essential oils. Thank you, Miss Desai, Jean-Paul said. I'm guessing it's easy to get hold of then. It is. Can I help with anything else? She asked, standing up. Just this... The other chemical found in relation to the body was lanolin. Would that ever be used in connection with myrrh that you're aware of? Kalanach asked. She paused, twisting a bracelet around her wrist a few times and frowning slightly. The only thing I can think of is that it might have been added to create an ointment, maybe for dry skin, or as a way of applying the myrrh. But you have to remember that myrrh's medical properties are still doubted by many. There's not much Western acceptance of its uses. It's more often found in Chinese herbal medicine. Thank you, Kalanak said. We appreciate your help. I'm sorry you had to be involved in these circumstances. I'm sorry for the boy, Indrani said quietly. The look on his face. I assumed emotions would leave your face after death. Even with his eyelids shut, I could read the terror as if his muscles had frozen. It's etched into him. I consider myself an advocate of peace, yet for the first time I can see why people call for the death penalty in such cases. Why should the monsters who perpetrate such evil continue to have a place on this earth? Jean-Paul showed the aromacologist out of the building. Kalanach stood in front of the board in their room, covered in photos of Malcolm Riley's body and the building site where it was found. He wrote a series of notes around the images. 
organ harvesting, lanolin, uses, sources, then myrrh, healing, antiseptic, embalming. The last option made no sense to him at all. Why consider embalming Malcolm Riley's body after his organs had been taken away from him so unceremoniously, then dumping him at the building site? His body had been used. That was the tragic reality. There was no emotion involved, no crime of passion or momentary loss of temper. Whoever had taken his life had calculated the value of killing a human being for their own ends, whatever those might have been. He checked his watch. Hopefully Ava would be at her desk soon for him to share what he knew. Not that she'd be in the mood for chatting. Interviewing grieving parents about their dead child was about as depressing as policing got. Chapter 9 Ava knocked on the Riley's door. Eight a.m. was too early, really, but if years of policing had taught her anything, it was that grief guaranteed both exhaustion and insomnia in equal measures. The Rileys would have cried, ranted, and been consumed with every negative emotion in the dictionary until they'd finally fallen asleep, then awoken only to lie in the cold, early dark, knowing that every day would start like that in their foreseeable future. Yesterday, she'd let specially trained police officers break the news of the death and remain with the family for as long as their presence was welcomed. They would continue to offer support in terms of answering day-to-day -day questions. Now, she had to try and figure out why Malcolm Riley had been chosen as a victim, and how he'd been identified as a target. Nine times out of ten, that meant causing offence. She took a deep breath. The door opened quietly, and a large woman stood, hands on hips, woolly cardigan stretched over a flowery blouse. Her face looked as if it had been attacked by gravity, jowls hanging, bags stretching for the floor beneath her eyes. You'll be DCI Turner. We were told to expect you. I'm Malcolm's grandmother. If you'll take a seat, I'll fetch my daughter and son-in-law. They're upstairs. It wasn't a good night. I understand, Ava said. Thank you for letting me in. She sat quietly in a living room that had become a tomb to a missing young man. They'd been expecting him back, of course. Most young men in their twenties who disappeared suddenly also reappeared. The same was less true of missing young women, but males weren't as likely to be kidnapped, raped, murdered. Not so today. Good morning, a man said, walking slowly forwards and offering Ava his hand. It was shaking as Ava grasped it. He looked broken, tall but bent at the shoulders, his hair greasy and unkempt, his shirt untucked at one side. Grief was the enemy of both the physical body and the mind. He was followed by a sweet-looking woman, dressed in pale grey, trousers, shirt, jumper, even her socks. She looks like a ghost, Ava thought, literally as if the life had bled from her. The woman tried to smile, but the wobble it brought was too much. Mrs. Riley, Ava took over. Sometimes it was easier to speak than wait to be spoken to. Forgive me for asking to speak with you at such a terrible time, but I need to know as much as I can about Malcolm and his disappearance. Interpol is working with the French police, and we have a liaison officer out there making sure nothing is missed. I'm in charge of the case at this end. Could we sit? Malcolm Riley's mother nodded slowly and turned on unwilling feet to head for a sofa. Ava pulled out a notebook, noticing the photos of Malcolm in ski gear against endless bright white backdrops. I appreciate your talking to me. I know the shock of Malcolm's death is still new. Telling you both how sorry I am for your loss won't help you but perhaps finding the person or people who hurt him will offer something more valuable. I want to know as much as you can tell me about your son, particularly about his final day. You'll have given that information to the police before, when you reported him missing, but sometimes additional questions occur to me when I'm listening to people talk. And now that we know it's a murder investigation, I may have different queries. All I can ask is that you bear with me, all right? 
Malcolm's parents made eye contact with one another, giving their consent only by not objecting. Ava understood perfectly. Words were hard enough to come by when you lost someone you loved through illness or accident. When they'd been cut open, their organs stolen from their body, what could you possibly find to say that did justice to the explosion of horror and grief your life had suddenly been reduced to? He uh, went to the gym, Mr. Riley said. His voice was hoarse. Ava had images of the night he and his wife had spent sobbing into one another's arms as he continued to speak. He went most days, unless he had an injury or needed to rest. That was the 24-hour gym at Westside Plaza Shopping Centre, Ava clarified. Yes, Mr. Riley said. He was part of a ski team, and they were expected to train regularly. Helps to avoid injuries. Looks like he loved it. Ava offered, turning her face to the sea of photos. He wanted to be in the Olympics. That was his dream, Mrs. Riley said, her face awash with tears. That was the thing about memories. One day they were just ordinary recollections, with more to be made, expectations keeping them in perspective and ready to be replaced. Once death came, those memories were newly precious. Gold to be mined and polished at every opportunity, in the knowledge that the total sum of your riches had already been amassed, and that every ounce, every fleck, had to be cherished forever. Eva paused, letting the Rileys recover, then continued. What time did he go to the gym? she asked. About 5.30pm. He came home from work, had a bite to eat, then changed and went. He was usually out until about eight, but that night he didn't come home. We didn't start worrying until ten, then we tried his mobile, but he didn't answer. We tried again, half an hour later, but by then his phone was switched off. His younger brother went out looking for him. Malcolm's car was still in the gym car park, but the receptionist said she'd seen him leave a couple of hours earlier. Ava already had a statement from the gym's receptionist in her file. There was CCTV footage, good quality and in colour, for once, that showed Malcolm Riley looking fit and healthy after exercising, exiting the building at 8.38pm precisely. The receptionist's estimate had been half an hour out, but no surprise there. It was a busy place, with plenty of people coming and going after work. Malcolm had turned left out of the main doors, bags slung over his shoulder. By then, he'd changed out of his gym gear into jeans T-shirt and a green jacket. There was footage of him on the running machine earlier for comparison. His hair still wet from the shower. Then he'd gone to the coffee shop come bar. That was at about 8pm. No CCTV in there, but a few regulars and staff had noticed him going in. Did he tell you he was going to the coffee shop afterwards? Ava asked. No. Mr. Riley shook his head. But he was well known at the gym. He's been a member there for more than two years. He often met friends and went for a drink or bite to eat afterwards. Anyone in particular he hung out with regularly? Why did they take his insides? Mrs. Riley blurted, suddenly standing up, fists clenched and pressed into her stomach. Her husband turned his gaze to the floor. Even his eyes, for God's sake! That's what we're trying to find out, Ava replied gently. I think that if we can figure out the motive for doing that, we'll be able to catch Malcolm's murderer. So are we supposed to bury only half of him? And do what? Add the rest when you find the missing pieces? Mrs. Riley went on. I'm afraid we need to keep Malcolm's body at the mortuary until the matter is resolved. We can transfer him back to the UK if you'd feel more comfortable having him in Edinburgh. We're not going to rest until we get answers for you. He'd met someone, Mr. Riley announced, a little more than a whisper. His wife whipped her head round, the fastest Ava had seen her move since arriving. What are you talking about? Mrs. Riley asked. Her husband rubbed a hand across his forehead. He asked me not to tell you. I don't know much about it myself, just that he'd met a woman he rather liked a few times, 
but that he wasn't sure it was going anywhere. Why not? Ava asked. Why was I not to be told? Malcolm's mother followed up. I gather she was married, or engaged or something. Malk was vague about it. He wouldn't tell me her name. I got the impression she'd asked him not to talk about her. Why exactly? Ava pressed. He said something about how she wouldn't like him talking about her. I overheard him on the phone one day. Malcolm sounded excited, younger than normal. He was quite reserved usually, so I asked who it was. I think he wanted to tell me more, but was torn. You should have told me anyway, Mrs. Riley said. It was an accusation. Malcolm knew you'd disapprove. He didn't want to upset you. Neither did I. And what if she had something to do with all of this? If I'd known, if you'd told me. How could some woman he liked have taken him to France? His passport's still in the drawer. And why would she do that? It makes no sense. That's why I didn't say anything before. It's ridiculous, he declared, banging his fist against his leg. Eva gave them both a moment to calm down. Which phone did you hear Malcolm talking to this woman on, and when? she asked. It was mobile. It was never found after he disappeared. As for when, that would have been about ten weeks ago. It was a Sunday afternoon, Mr. Riley said. So, two weeks before he disappeared then? I'll check his mobile call logs with his telecom provider. I don't suppose you know where he met this woman? I don't, but he was keen on her. And he obviously thought she felt the same, or I don't think he'd have mentioned her to me at all. It couldn't have been her, could it? He stared into Ava's eyes, looking for more than information, wanting affirmation, reassurance, perhaps forgiveness. We have to cover all angles when we investigate. I'll do my best to locate this woman. Until then, it's best not to torture yourselves with hypotheticals. I'll leave you to it. If you think of anything else, please do get in touch. How could you keep that from me? Mrs. Riley hissed at her husband. He was my son. I had a right to know. It was nothing. Please, Anne, don't upset yourself. Don't upset myself, she raged, looking around the room before choosing the nearest object to seize. It was a vase. Her husband looked on in silence as it smashed in the fireplace. My boy was gutted like a fish, and you're asking me not to upset myself. What is it that you want me to do? Sit in bed quietly and cry into a hanky? What if this woman's husband found out about them and decided to get rid of Malcolm? Did you think of that? No. No, I I'm sure Malcolm wouldn't have let it get that far. Mrs. Riley, Ava said, I understand. No, you don't! Malcolm Riley's mother screamed. On the final word, she aimed an open palm at Ava's face, slapping hard enough for Ava's neck to crack as her head whirled round. Oh, my God! I'm sorry! Oh, my God! She gasped, falling to her knees. Ava took to the floor beside her, taking Malcolm's mother's hands in her own, gently stroking the hand that had slapped her. You're right, Ava said. I don't understand. It's okay. The worst thing is, I know that I never want to have to understand, not fully. I never want to be feeling what you're feeling now. That's why I do this job. I want to make sure that as few people as possible have to go through what you're experiencing. All I can promise is that I'll do my best, and that I'll make everyone else do their best. And I won't stop until I can give you answers. Mrs. Riley drew herself into a ball, rocking back and forth, eventually letting her husband kneel next to her and wrap her in his arms. Ava suspected they would be there, on that cold wooden floor, for an awfully long time. She let herself out. An hour later, Ava was at home changing out of her uniform. 
In spite of the major investigation team's non-uniform policy, she had always felt more comfortable treating visits to the recently bereaved with the utmost formality. That mark of respect was the least she could offer. The rest of the day was going to be briefings and normal graft, though, and her jeans were beckoning. She was almost ready to leave for the station when her doorbell rang. Eva sighed. Her cheek was still raw from the monumental slap dealt by a grieving mother. The blow had been well delivered, and while Eva didn't resent it at all, it had left finger marks that would be like carrying a physical part of Malcolm Riley with her for the rest of the day. Fitting, perhaps, given that so much of him was actually missing. She wandered towards the door, feeling less than charitable towards whoever was out there ringing her doorbell so persistently. "'Hey, you,' a voice said as Ava began to open the door. "'I was hoping you might be here.' "'Natasha,' Ava said, stepping back to let her best friend in, grinning at the unexpected visit. They didn't see each other often enough, and exchanging texts hardly did justice to the number of years they'd had each other's backs. It couldn't be helped. Natasha was head of philosophy at Edinburgh University, not to mention chairing numerous panels and writing articles. The two of them almost never managed to make their free evenings coincide. You just quote me. She checked her watch. But I've got time to put the kettle on. God, it's good to see you. Natasha turned, shrugging off her coat slowly and putting it carefully on a hook before following Ava into the kitchen. You mean you've actually got milk in your fridge that's in date? Natasha smiled. You're so rude, I'm pretty sure I have. She opened her fridge door and peered at the label on a milk carton. Ah, see? Still good until tomorrow. Now you have to apologise. Apologise my arse, Natasha said, sitting down. Ava, I need to talk to you. Yes, please, anything. I've had a bloody awful morning so far. Seriously, probing grieving parents for details of their child's life at the worst possible moment. You know it's going to be bad, but nothing prepares you for the sense of devastation. She stretched her arms, waiting for the kettle to boil. Want some toast? No, thanks. I'm not hungry. Sit down with me? No time. Ava grabbed a hairband from her pocket and tied her long, curly brown hair up high on her head. I got two different teams working up cases, one here and one in France. Thank God Luke was already there, or I'd have lost two officers to liaison posts. Ava, Natasha said firmly, I have cancer. Ava looked at her, frowned as she half-smiled, shook her head. What are you talking about? I found a lump in my left breast a month ago. The doctor was great, referred me straight to the hospital. The consultant's been amazing. They operated two weeks ago, removed a sample and did a biopsy. I got the results yesterday afternoon. Ava closed her eyes, waited, opened them again, gritted her teeth. A month, she said eventually. You've been going through this for a fucking month, and you're at my door for the first time today. Her voice was at yelling pitch. How the fuck could you ever think that was okay? She turned, tried to pick up the kettle, but slopped boiling water across the tops of the mugs in her hand. Ava, stop, please, Natasha said, standing and walking round the table towards her. No, Ava said. If you're here, it's because it's bad news, and I can't hear it, Tasha. God help me, I know it's you going through this, not me, but I can't have anything happen to you. I don't want to hear it, I can't stand it. Natasha wrapped her arms around Ava's shoulders, holding her tight. I couldn't have this conversation before I knew for sure what it was. You'd have made the same choice. It was less painful not to think too hard about it. I knew you'd want to come to every appointment with me, ask every question, cross-examine the doctors, but I just wanted to let it all happen without a fight. How bad? Eva whispered into her friend's hair. Bad, but not hopeless. I won't give you all the medical terms. I've driven myself mad looking it all up already. It's stage two. I'll need another operation. Chemo, maybe radiation therapy. Then they'll review again and see how I'm doing. She stepped back, wiping tears from Ava's face with her thumbs. 
Oh, holy shit. I'm so sorry I shouted at you. I'm such an idiot. You came here because you needed me, and I... Actually, I came here for you to yell at me and get it out of your system. You're nothing if not predictable. She grinned. Go to hell, Ava said, more tears falling. Tasha, I have to ask. It's all right, Natasha said. Roughly speaking, there's a 50% survival rate for the type of cancer I have at this stage. It's nowhere else in my body yet, which is the good news. Apparently my aunt had it too, so there's a family history to take into account. Although I found out about that, as ever, when it was too late for a heads up. So you've told your parents, then? Natasha nodded. How were they with you? Well, they managed not to ask if it was something I'd caught because I'm a lesbian, so I guess that was progress. She laughed and Ava's kitchen rang with the hollowness of it. They were shocked, I think, but told me they're sure I'll be fine. Not what I wanted to hear, oddly. I mean, I want people to be reassuring, but it's so bland when it happens like that. Almost dismissive, like they can't cope with the reality, so it's an easy line to trot out. Ava sighed. Still want that tea? She asked. Damn right I do. I can't drink booze at the moment, so tea's about my only decent option. Ava busied herself with the mugs and tea bags. Anyway, I'm here to ask you just to stand by me, I suppose. At the moment, I'm not quite sure what's ahead. I have another appointment at the hospital tomorrow to agree a treatment plan. I know you're busy with your caseload, but I'll be there, Ava said. Whatever you need, just message me about the time. I'll drive you. You don't have to go that far, Natasha smiled, taking the offered mug and sitting back down at the kitchen table with it. And that's just because you're a liability on the road already. I honestly can't let the general public be put at risk if you're even more distracted than usual. Eva sat opposite her. Fuck you! Natasha grinned. I love you, Eva retorted. And I'm so ashamed about how I reacted. I wasn't angry at you. I know that. Natasha reached across and took Eva's hand in hers. Do you remember when we were fourteen? That little gobshite, Barry Beckwith, told everyone he'd put his hand up my skirt. I came to you crying. Everyone was gossiping about it, and I thought my life was basically over. I screamed at you because you hadn't punched him in the face as soon as you found out. Did you have to remind me? Ava laughed. The next day, Barry turned up at whatever awful party we were at with a black eye and a cut lip, telling everyone he'd been mugged for his backpack. I knew it was you, even though you never admitted it. I hated seeing you hurt like that. Eva smiled gingerly. I still do. At least I could just go and punch Barry Beckwith. What the hell am I supposed to do with this? Hold my hand. Make me laugh. Give me space when I ask for it. What actually did happen with Barry then? I called at his house, flirted with him, told him I wanted to do the same as he'd done with you. He invited me up to his bedroom, and as soon as he closed the door, I smacked him in the face. He tried to grab me to stop me from leaving, so I headbutted him. Only he was quite a few inches taller than me, so I only contacted his lip. I knew he'd never have the balls to admit he'd been beaten up by a girl, so I wasn't worried. He had tears in his eyes as I left, which I figured was almost good enough payment for what he'd done to you. I'm so glad we've always been friends. Mainly because as an enemy you're terrifying. Whatever happens, I'll be at your side, Eva said softly the laughter gone. You can't leave me, Natasha. I won't let you. Not even you can control this one, she replied. But I appreciate the fact that you're going to try, more than you could possibly know. Chapter 10 Elenuta held a bag of ice against Annika's cheek and waited for the girl to stop crying. Most of the men, and a few women, who visited Finlay's establishment were there for something much less honest than plain old sex. They wanted to violate. Knowing that it was non-consensual was part of what they were buying. Getting away with throwing a few punches, the odd hand around the throat, sticking rough fingers wherever they liked, that was all included in the price too. Paying good money for a chance to express their hatred and rage in physical terms with a no-comeback was a given. 
The last bastard had gone too far with Hanukkah, though. She had finger marks on both thighs where her legs had been held open, multiple grazes across her throat where rings had tugged at her delicate skin, and a lump coming up on her face that would take two weeks to reduce. One of Finlay's men came in, stared around the room at the four women crowded in there, syringe in hand. This will make you feel better, he said gruffly. She doesn't need that, Elenuta said. I look after her. Boss's orders don't mess, the goon muttered. Annika stared glassily at the syringe, then gave a weak nod, holding out her arm. Elenuta took her hand, trying to pull her away. Don't, she whispered. Annika, let me help you. You'll get the same treatment if you don't keep your nose out, Elenuta was told. The man shoved her away from Annika. She watched as the needle pierced the girl's skin, plunging its oblivion into her nervous system. Annika's sobs turned into a groan, then a sigh. Silence. Why? Elenuta asked the man as he withdrew the needle and checked Annika's pupils. Finlay's fed up with her crying. She won't last. Too fragile for his liking. He's decided to race her next month. Believe me, a little bit of smack's not going to hurt her. Elenuta stared at him. Most of the guards refused to enter into conversations with the woman. This one couldn't seem to care less. She wondered if she was being set up for a punishment, then decided it didn't matter anyway. Being scared of every consequence was exhausting. What's your name? Elenuta asked. Digger, he said. You should go and eat. The rest of the women had already filed out of the room into the small kitchen they were allowed to use, with supervision. There was one dull knife for them to cut up food, and it had to be handed straight back to whoever was in charge once it had been used. Not hungry, Elenuta said. What's race? Digger looked over his shoulder, and Elenuta knew he was checking to make sure Finlay hadn't sneaked in. He had a habit of doing that. He could be almost silent as he approached. Finlay enjoyed keeping everyone on their toes. Two or three times a day he appeared to check up on them, going from flat to flat, making sure the women were busy on their backs, and that none of the men who worked for him were getting lazy or dipping into the takings. Elenuta checked the clock every time he turned up, there was no pattern to it, and that was how he liked it, she realised. She and Finlay had spent what he'd called some quality time together after her failed escape attempt. Her ribs wouldn't heal properly for weeks. He'd spared her face as that was what made him money, but other aspects of his punishment had been sufficiently brutal that she'd simply curled up in a corner and not dared move or speak until he'd left the flat. You're better off never finding out he replied, as Annika began to tip over. Elenuta caught her, and Digger grabbed a cushion off the tatty sofa to slide under her head as she hit the floor. Will Annika come back from race? Elenuta asked, quietly. Digger stood up. I doubt it, he said. That's enough questions, you'll get me in a right load of shit. Will I have to race? Elenuta asked. You won't, if you keep the clients happy and don't pull any more stunts like running away. The police have been all over Jean's place since. Finlay's pissed. You got off lightly. I wouldn't push your luck. How many women in race? Elenuta continued. Digger wanted to talk. She could tell. He was one of the less brutal supervisors. She'd never seen him hit any of the women, or take advantage of the free sex that was on offer. Her assessment was that he liked a quiet life. Not so quiet that he wasn't prepared to shoot heroin in the arm of anyone making a fuss, but that was what Finlay had ordered. If any of the women were trouble, it was procedure to shut them up and leave their warm body on a bed for whatever use could be made of them. Four, Digger said quietly, checking his watch. Well, help me get her back into bed. She's not going to wake up any time soon, and Finlay won't like seeing her lying there when the clients come in to choose one of you. They race each other? She persisted, taking hold of Annika beneath the arms. For fuck's sake, would you quit it, woman? 
He picked up Annika's legs and began walking backwards into the narrow hallway, down which the bedrooms were situated. An arm slithered around Elenuta's waist, crushing the air from her, leaving her lurching forward trying to hold onto Annika's head before it smashed to the floor. Do you really want to know? Finley Mock whispered into her ear. She could feel the wetness of his lips against her. I told her to quit it, boss, Digger said, looking miserable. I heard you, mate. This one doesn't learn, does she? Who are those ribs? Hmm, still sore, I'm guessing. He slid his arm up from her waist to her ribcage, tightening his grip. Tears sprang to Elenuta's eyes as she fought for breath. But education's a good thing. Maybe I should show you what the race is all about. It's guaranteed to make you behave yourself. You can manage this other wee cunny on your own, can't you, Digger? It was a decision, not a question. And you, you pretty bitch, can come with me. Digger, fetch my laptop from the kitchen before dealing with a whore. He took Elenuta by the hair, pulling her backwards up the corridor, feet tumbling over one another, hauling her suddenly sideways when they reached an unoccupied bedroom. Throwing her onto the bed, Finlay climbed on next to her, winding an arm beneath her neck to pull her in close. Digger delivered the laptop, and Finlay tapped a series of icons until a video came up, the first image frozen in place. Watch this, Finlay grinned holding Elenuta's head in place with one hand as he took a knife from his pocket and lay tossing it in the air and catching it. Four girls came into view from a small doorway, each wearing ragged underwear, no shoes on their feet. They looked back as the door shut, grabbing each other's hands, stepping forward inch by inch. Elenuta could hear them whispering in at least three different languages mixed with some broken English. It was clear they had no idea where they were or what to expect. Nothing good, though. A light came on to one side, and a bank of chairs could be seen on a large glass-partitioned balcony. One hundred men, if not more, were seated in rows and looking eagerly down at the women. They began banging on the chairs, the floor, whatever was at hand. Slowly at first, the beat increasing steadily, a cacophony of masculinity. Finally, a man stepped forward, looking smarter than usual. He'd made an effort, Elenuta realised. The thought chilled her. This was Finlay dressed to impress, enjoying a crowning moment. The four women stood, frozen, huddled together. Good evening, you bunch of cocksuckers! Finley shouted, to a gleeful response from his audience. Welcome to the third race. Most of you know what to expect by now, so I'll keep this short, and you lot keep your hands at your pants while I'm talking. He pointed vaguely into the crowd, but at no one in particular, and Elenuta understood that he practiced and polished this little speech, self-proclaimed king for a couple of hours. Do you want to see your champions? There was a further hammering of approval, but apparently not quite loud enough for Finlay's liking. Well, do ye, ya bastards? A much louder roar that time. All right, then. He threw back his arms, a circus ringmaster drawing the audience in, revving them up. Another door opened and three men walked out, each wearing only shorts and trainers. Elenuta's first thought was how ridiculous they looked, like those fake wrestlers whose every blow and fall was carefully choreographed. One was covered in tattoos, literally covered from ankle to neck. No names here, Finlay said, with a nod of acknowledgement towards the camera, but these gentlemen have paid a high price for this honour, higher than the rest of you wankers bid anyway. Another crowd belly laugh for that. So give it up for them. Finlay walked forward, raising each man's right arm one after the other. Tattoos first, then a skinnier man with a scar down the length of his torso, and finally a shorter male with an enormous girth and loose flesh folds dripping from his upper body. 
The men accepted their applause with chest beating, raised fists and celebratory middle fingers pointed in the direction of the admiring crowd. Now to meet your skanks. Let's hope for their sakes that they haven't got too out of shape spending all that time on their backs. Real life Finlay, lying on the bed, gave a snort of laughter at his own comic genius for that one. Bitch number one! He grabbed the nearest woman to him and pulled her closer to the audience. Great titties or what? But you can't wait to see those bouncing up and down when she runs. He thrust her towards the nearby wall. Bitch number two! The crowd was lapping it up, their appreciation rising to fever pitch. Best blowjobs for fifty miles. You'd best hope she's a fast runner then. The woman he took by the arm gave him a look that could have burned green wood. Helenuta saw her own loathing reflected in her eyes and knew she shouldn't look at Finlay while she watched the remainder of the video. What he saw in them would get her killed in a heartbeat. Bitch number three! This girl, definitely more girl than woman, he grabbed around the waist and lifted into the air. Grown men have fainted at the tightness of her pussy. We bring you nothing but the best here. He dropped the girl, who sank to her knees on the floor, hair hanging limply over her face. And last, but by no means least, the winner from the last race, bitch number four. Can she repeat the brilliance of her last run, or did she only have one victory in her? Finlay circled the last woman, who was looking twitchy, jerking her knees up one after the other. Her eyes huge, haunted, like some terrified Olympian on speed. Rules! Like there fucking are any. The bitches get a sixty-second head start on the hunt. They can run, hide, fight, disable one another, team up, whatever they like. Champions, same applies to you. All you have to do is move like fuck. Elenuta felt vomit rising in her throat at the word hunt. The women were starting to edge away from Finlay. Three of them together the previous winner, as if that term could ever apply, keeping her distance from the group. There are screens above your head that will capture any action you can't see where you're sitting. Don't worry, we won't let you miss a thing. Ellen Uta couldn't see the screens the audience had access to, but she didn't need them. It was all here, ready for Finlay to gloat over. She wanted to refuse to watch, but even if Finlay would let her get away with that, and he wouldn't, Knowledge was a currency, and at the moment she was flat out broke. She needed to know what possible dangers lay ahead. Turn up those lights, Finlay shouted, and like a Broadway show, the camera rose into the air. Elenuta assumed it was a drone, and lights flickered on in what was apparently a vast warehouse, fitted out with a maze of partitions. Here and there, metal staircases, more like ladders, rose above the temporary six-foot walls and facilitated access to a different part of the building. But using those ladders would make the women more visible. There were what appeared to be cupboards, large bins, piles of sheets, all providing the false promise of a place to hide. Elenuta estimated the warehouse interior was maybe 20,000 square feet. It was hard to tell with the sketchy light and movement of the drone. It was vast, by any reckoning. The drone dipped closer to the floor and length of barbed wire came into focus, which would force the runners to either jump, dip below it, or turn back. Dappled light on the ceiling caught her eye. What's this? she asked, without thinking, giving Finlay a chance to enjoy her interest. He pointed at the warehouse floor, although there was nothing to see from the drone's viewpoint. Smashed glass. Five different patches of it. There have to be some handicaps, after all. But they have no shoes, Elenuta said. It's not fair. Not fair? I paid good money for those whores. I need a return on that investment, and that means putting on a proper show. Do you have any idea how much it costs me to house and feed you lot? Elenuta stared at him, the space between her eyebrows a knot of wrinkles as she waited for him to laugh. 
He didn't. He meant every word of it. The resentment at the bills incurred feeding them stale bread and out-of-date chicken nuggets. The heating was turned off overnight and only put back on during client hours so they didn't get complaints. The sheets were the only items washed regularly. The women hand-washed their personal items in the sink overnight. Elenita wondered how far gone Finlay was if he had genuinely persuaded himself that he was somehow being taken advantage of by the women he held captive and sold every day. Here we go, Finlay told Elenuta, his face alight with excitement. Now don't you fucking look away. I don't want you missing any of the good bits. One final word of warning to you all. On screen, Finlay wagged his finger. First man to lay hands on any woman gets her to himself. Once a man has her, no other man can touch her. Three men, four women. The last woman standing gets a good meal, a hot bath, and a comfy bed with none of you cunts in it tonight. That's it. He raised his left hand in the air. Countdown. Five. The last race's winner looked deep into the maze, head down, knees bent. The other women looked terrified, hands still wrapped together. Four! The audience was on its feet to a man, and the noise coming from that side of the warehouse was deafening. Elenuta couldn't hear Finlay count down after that, but she watched his lips move. Three, two, one. The previous winner was gone. She flew into the maze, taking an outside lane, glancing back over her shoulder, only once as the three other women looked on, dazed and bemused. Run, you fucking whores! Finlay shouted. If you don't want to die with your standing, then friggin' run! As one, like the herd of zebra that spotted the lion, they bolted, moving chaotically, tripping over their own feet and each other's. Elenuta wanted to shout instructions to them as if she were watching in real time. But it was way too late for that. The camera focused on a clock on the wall, the countdown already at thirty-seven seconds and falling as Finlay's champions jumped up and down, ready for the off. Tattoo had his teeth bared. The big man was sweating profusely, sparkling in the half-light. Elenuta prayed that a heart attack might strike him down in his revolting excitement before he could set off. The scarred man, though, was something else. Something be still. His face twisted with a hatred so terrifying that Elenuta could hardly bear to watch. She pitied anyone who crossed his path. He was a man without limits. She'd met such men before and had been grateful to have survived the encounters. The image suddenly split into four quarters presumably a reflection of what the audience in the warehouse had seen. The footage was from drones, four separate cameras. This was no small operation. Finlay had to have four men, one set to follow each woman, to provide constant footage. Two of the women had stuck together, and the others had gone off alone. The countdown was at ten seconds, and the men were poised and ready to sprint. Those drones are the bloody best you can get. Cost me a fucking packet, Finlay lectured. Uh-huh, Elenuta murmured. Her hands were gripping the bed covers, as if to tether herself away from the screen. The previous winner was at the far side of the maze now, pausing, hands on knees and panting, looking behind her, then ahead to decide tactics. Not getting yourself cornered was the obvious priority, and she wasn't. She had three directions to run in. The next decision was whether to hide or keep running. The problem with that was exhaustion. Sooner or later, the after-effect of the adrenaline would be to drain the woman's energy, rather than to provide a boost. And then there would be nothing left to fight with if, when, the moment came. Elenuta looked at the other screen sections. The youngest woman was trying and failing to open an old metal cupboard, tugging uselessly at the doors, which had obviously been deliberately locked and put there to distract the runners. Horns blasted, echoing hard around the bare walls. The men, like hounds released, began to run. 
The audience made noises that might have come from behind the bars in a zoo. The scene was nothing short of gladiatorial, if the surroundings were less than Romanesque. The young woman who'd been attempting to open the cupboard had finally given up on that plan and was trying to cover herself with a pile of old sheets that had been dumped on the floor. However slight she was, there was no disguising the person-shaped mound in the middle of the rags. Get up! Elenuta hissed through the screen at the girl. Get up now! She can't hear you, love! Finley laughed. Entertaining, isn't it? Animal! Elenita said. Finlay leaned forward, poking out his tongue to lick her face from eye to chin, leaving a trail of saliva for her to wipe away. The big bloke's surprisingly light on his feet. Watch him go here. Finlay pointed as the largest of the three men took a corner at speed and caught sight of a woman ahead of him. Oh, the tension, he mocked. I should charge ten times what I do for this. People would take out loans if they had to. Elenuta chose to look at Finlay rather than the chase underway on the screen. How much for ticket? she asked. Ah, see, now you're showing your true colours. He tapped the side of her head with his forefinger. I knew there was a smart wee brain in there. One hundred and fifty for a seat in the audience, one thousand to participate. You can stop looking at me like I'm something you trod in, you snotty bitch. I'm a fucking businessman, that's what I am. A thousand pounds, Elenuta thought. To be able to chase and capture a woman to rape, beat and abuse on camera in front of an audience. In the end, though, not so different than what happened to all of them every day. Just less of a spectacle. Three of the screen sections disappeared as one enlarged to follow the progress of the big man more closely. The drone was overhead both him and one of the women, face to face, each panting. Him grinning, her glancing backwards at the stretch of broken glass on the floor behind her that was perhaps four metres long. Too long to jump, but there was no way she was going to be able to climb the partition. The only other option was to fight the man and hope she could deal enough of a blow to give her time to escape the way she'd come. He motioned to her with his fingers, palms up. Come on, then, was the message. Just you try it. The woman whipped round, dipping down as she went, grabbing a piece of broken glass in her left hand. She was no fool. He had several stone on her, and even though they were the same height, fighting him off was going to be tough, unarmed. With the glass, though, she stood a chance. He took a step back, taking his time, before pulling a pair of leather gloves from his pocket. It wouldn't stop the glass entirely, Elenuta thought, but it gave him more protection. Certainly, he wasn't about to back down now. He'd paid a thousand pounds, and he wanted it repaid in flesh. The woman stepped forward, keeping just out of grabbing distance, but presenting the man with an opportunity to try. He lunged for her, and she leapt backwards into one side, pulling the man's arm and propelling him towards the glass-covered section of floor, then letting him go. He fell under his own momentum, helped by his front-loaded gravity. Only letting himself crash to his knees first saved him from being peppered with broken glass from head to toe. Still, he howled in pain. The woman was already gone, leaping back down the corridor in which she'd been caught, glass fragment held out front. The man got up slowly, his knees and lower legs bloodied, staggering slightly before righting himself fully. Wrenching a shard of glass from one leg, he shouted into the empty area. Elenita's nails were her own shards of glass in her palms. If the man caught up with that same woman again, he would make her pay over and over, once for the pain and again for the humiliation. He hurled a slice of glass at the drone, hovering about his head, and spun round to follow her. Slowly, this time, though. He wouldn't be sprinting again for a while. Elenuta allowed herself a smile. The screen returned to its four-way view. The tattooed man could be seen walking carelessly through the maze, calling out. Of course, there wasn't any rush. 
The sprint at the start had been in the spirit of the race, but the reality was that in a closed circuit the men could take as much time as they needed. Sooner or later they'd stumble across a woman, and then it was only a matter of time until they got what they wanted. Tattoo walked down a long stretch, suddenly stopped, cocked his head to one side, turned and retraced his steps. There on the ground at his feet was a pile of old rags, unmistakably shaking. Tattoo located the drone that was recording his progress and grinned widely into the lens. Like some Victorian theatre villain, he tiptoed forward, still looking up at the camera with a finger dramatically over his lips, making the most of the moment and the crowd's adulation. He reached out a hand, held it over the top of the pile, then grabbed the linen and whipped it away. On the floor, huddled, was the youngest of the women, trying to squirm away. He took hold of her by the throat, taking a knee at her side as the camera closed in to capture her facial expression. It was sheer terror. Elenita thought she'd seen fear before. God knew she'd felt enough of it herself, but this was something deeper, more primeval. Please, the girl mouthed at the man, don't. He laughed, roared with it, so much larger and stronger than her that he didn't even bother using his other hand as he picked her up and slammed her into the wall. The back of her skull smashed into a large bolt sticking out of the brickwork, and her eyes floated upwards for a moment. Fighting her way back into consciousness, she clawed at his fingers, slapped uselessly at the pressure on her throat. Her chest hitched as she tried to draw breath, her eyes beginning to bulge. Blood trickled through her hair and down the sides of her neck from the head injury. He'll kill her, Elenuta muttered. Well, duh, what did you think they were paying for? Elenuta's hands flew over her mouth. The girl was beginning to change colour. The tracks of burst blood vessels were appearing in her eyes, and her head was flopping left and right, out of control. Her legs were buckling and flapping. No, Elenuta sobbed. That's just the first. The other two are much more inventive. Wait and see. Elenuta wrenched herself from Finlay's grip, losing a fistful of hair as she threw herself across the room. His laptop continued to produce a hateful audio, gurgling, choking, wailing, accompanied by the roar of the crowd in the industrial coliseum, each of them desperate to watch that final gruesome moment of death. It didn't take long. Do you not want to know who won? Finlay asked, climbing off the bed and walking to stand in front of Elenuta. She shook her head. Right then. If you can't take it, maybe you should stop asking fucking questions. Have I made my point? Elenuta nodded. Good. Now, that's put me right in the mood for a fuck. On the bed and get your knickers off. I haven't got long. Chapter 11 Detective Sergeant Max Tripp sat in Ava's office, wondering why his boss looked like death, but knowing better than to ask. How long has this boy been missing now? Ava asked, scribbling notes on a pad. Five days. Bart went to his usual place of work at a restaurant. That's a part-time job as he's a student. He was due home that night. Didn't show. He left his mobile in his bedroom, so there's no way of tracking him. Could he have just bailed? Stressed with the college course and the job dropped off the map? Ava was going through the motions, and she knew it. Tripp was an experienced officer who always covered all the bases. His mum's a widow and they're very close. Great relationship, both by the mother's account and by all the family, friends and neighbours we've spoken to. He's got a bright future, finds the college work easy. No indicators for an unexplained disappearance and he hasn't touched his bank account since he went missing. Plus, his boss at work said the night he went missing, Bart had booked in several extra shifts for the following week and had said he was happy to wait for his wages until the next night. So if he was about to run, he'd have taken the cash at the very least. Ava put her pen down. That's about it. No regular girlfriend, but he was a good-looking and popular lad. He'd never fail to go home unless it was planned in advance, 
Apparently he worried too much about his mum being alone for that. Last known person he was in contact with? One of the other waiters said goodnight to him as he left the restaurant. Bart was planning on cycling home. His bike was found the next day, still secured to a fence post. No sign of his belongings. Reporting was fast. His mother called the police the morning she discovered him missing. That's fair to say she's devastated. She's no doubt whatsoever that something terrible has happened. The Malcolm Riley scenario? Ava said. Exactly. The problem is that with no evidence about how Malcolm disappeared, who was involved, no forensics and no witnesses, linking the two cases relies entirely on the type of victim and the fact that both disappeared in an unexplained manner. Similarities as far as you see them? She asked. Age of the victims, within two years of each other? Obviously they both live in Edinburgh, both schooled here, both have jobs in the city, both fit and healthy and well-liked, close family ties, no money problems, no enemies or associates that might cause concern. Drugs? Ava interjected. Malcolm Riley's talk screen from France came back with mixed results. They did hair testing, which is pretty thorough, and which shows absolutely no drug use as that would have lodged in the hair route. There has to be some allowance for the fact that other organs were missing, so liver and kidneys couldn't be checked. Brain shows no alcohol had been consumed in hours prior to death. The stomach had a concentration of oral morphine, though, which didn't show in the hair test, so it hadn't reached the hair route. It looks as though a very large dose was given, which would have put Malcolm into an almost comatose state. Allowing his killer to do whatever he or she liked, Ava said, without him registering much pain, Tripp added. What about Bart? Any indication that he had either a drug or alcohol problem? Didn't like wasting his hard-earned money on alcohol, although he had the occasional drink. Drugs were something he said he abhorred, although he wouldn't be the first kid to have one opinion then do something different. Only you clearly don't think that's the case, Eva commented, studying Tripp's face. I don't. He lost his father in a tragic accident and seems to have worried about his mother constantly. I don't think drugs is a risk he'd have taken. OK, but let's not discount it entirely. When you care for someone as deeply as he obviously cared about his mother, the simple stress of worrying can make it difficult to cope. She frowned, picked up her pen again, and underlined a couple of sentences as she rubbed her eyes. But I agree. We have to investigate the theory that the two disappearances might be linked. If nothing else, it could be the break we need in the Riley case. You can have D.C. Monroe. Try to recreate the end of that last evening in the restaurant. See if it doesn't jog some memories. Go through the bookings list. Get in touch with anyone who was in there that night. Liaise with D.I. Karanach, if you need to, about the Riley case, and see if there's any link between the two men that we are unaware of. Yes, ma'am. Tripp stood up. So will D.I. Karanach be back after the Riley case wraps up, do you think? Ava didn't look up. There's still a trafficking investigation ongoing. He's only assigned a Scottish liaison officer to Interpol on the Riley case because he was already out there. Honestly, I can't say when he'll be back. Tripp shifted his weight from one foot to another until he found the right words to say. The squad misses him, ma'am. I should hope so, Ava responded. If one of our officers weren't missed... It would be a pretty sad indictment of MIT. As I said, talk to Karanak directly for information. I'm sure he'll be able to update you as to how the trafficking operation is progressing. Right, said Tripp gently. Oh, and D.I. Graham asked me to let him know when you were free. Shall I tell him he can come up and speak with you now? Eva sighed. Um, actually, I have a couple of calls to make that won't wait. Could you message the detective inspector and ask him to email me instead? That way I can deal with it while I clear some other matters off my to-do list. I will, Mum. Tripp nodded. And tell D.I. Graham that I want him and D.S. Lively on the Gene Oldman murder full-time. There should be a lead by now. Oldman must have had any number of unsavoury contacts for us to bring in for questioning. Tripp left quietly. He knew a dismissal tone when he heard it. Not that D.C.I. Turner pulled authority very often... She obviously wasn't in the mood for small talk. He messaged D.I. Graham from his mobile as he wandered down the stairs to find most of the squad gathered in the incident room. A breeze of silence wafted across as he entered. 
You seen the DCI yet? Lively shouted, breaking the quiet. I have, Tripp replied. He was an unwilling public speaker, but people obviously wanted to know what the structure of the next week was to be. I'm going to be following up on the Bart Campbell disappearance with DC Monroe. The chief agrees there's a possible link to Malcolm Riley, which needs looking into. She wants you and D.I. Graham to keep moving on the Gene Oldman murder. Aye. Bet she wants me dealing with that one, keeping me where I belong, out with a good folk of Wester Hills. Lively sniped. Tripp wandered over to speak with Janet Monroe as Detective Inspector Graham entered the room. Right, there's a lot to do. Sergeant Lively, any news on the footprint we found on the floor in Gene Oldman's kitchen? Graham began. Sure. Given that it was only a partial print, the shoe size is estimated to be a five, so we're working on the basis that whoever left the print is either an adolescent, or if it's an adult, it's likely to be a female. The foot width is slim, although that may due to not putting the full foot on the floor because of the injury. DNA profile is definitely not a match for Oldman's. You a thing from any of Oldman's family members yet that might help? Graham asked. He's got a sister whose exact words were, Why the fuck are you bothering me with this shite? Sodden get got what he deserved. Does she have an alibi for the time of death? Depends if you call long-term residents and Her Majesty's prison court and veil an alibi or not. I'd say Conton probably has a better community spirit than Wester Hills. Lively sniggered. Sir? PC Biddlecombe arrived in the doorway, panting. Yes, Constable. Farmer from a pig farm out at Roslyn just called in? She stood, breathless, staring into the packed incident room as if it were an exam hall and she'd forgotten to study. And that would be of interest to us because... Lively prompted. Oh my God, right. He found pieces of skulls this morning when he was mucking out a pen. He certainly weren't there a week ago. Should I, um... Give Sergeant Lively the details, Graham instructed. And get a crime scene investigation team out there straight away. Biddlecombe spun round to exit as quickly as possible, succeeding only in smacking her left shoulder into the doorframe. There was a ripple of laughter that Graham quelled with a look. You want me to go out there and take a look in person? Lively asked. Yes, but keep it brief. Liaise with a forensic team, then get back on with the Oldman case. The leads are getting staler every day. These skull fragments may not be human. Or they may be from ancient bodies the pigs have just scratched up from the ground. I don't want to get distracted by it until we have some hard facts. Take some gloves, Sarge, a young officer shouted gleefully from the back of the room. That pig shit isn't going to search itself. Is that right, DC Swift? I'll be needing some assistance then. Grab your coat, lad, you've pulled. There was a groan, followed by the sound of back slapping. I'm supposed to be helping DS Trip establish who was in the restaurant the night Bart Campbell disappeared, sir. John Swift moaned. I can spare you, constable, Trip confirmed, and I'll notify DCI Turner about the skulls. Lively threw a high-vis jacket in Swift's direction, and the two of them headed for the door. Chapter 12 Fleury Merogis Prison, the largest prison in Europe, sat in 180 hectares of a southern suburb of Paris, a reminder to all who saw what good came of criminal enterprises. Sadly, it was a lesson that hadn't been learned by its 4,100 occupants. A central polygon-shaped building offshot five three-armed wings, each home to four floors of inmates, men, women and juveniles. Wire on the roofs discouraged daring attempts at escape by helicopter, necessary given the connections some of the inmates had. Over the years, Kalanach and Jean-Paul had delivered plenty of new guests to fleury Merogis, many of whom were still in residence, some never destined to freely see the light of day. They showed their Interpol credentials and emptied their pockets into lockers. Built fairly recently in the 1960s, the prison atmosphere was nonetheless tense, with an oppressive sense of history, perhaps because time moved so slowly within its walls. 
They didn't talk as they were escorted to the interview rooms. Each of them caught up in their own memories of previous criminal endeavours whose perpetrators had been incarcerated there. A terrorist cell, whose movements they'd watched until minutes before an attack. A copycat killer who'd perfected his skills to such a pinnacle that he'd far outshone the man he'd admired. Others, whose lives were just pathetic, and who'd turned to crime in boredom and frustration. Fleury Merogis was a miniature city, with all its class divides, volatile microeconomies, victors and victims, every conceivable language whispered and screamed in its hallways and darker places. Kalanach hated it. Georgia Moretti Russo had been fifty-three years of age when Jean-Paul led the case that resulted in her multiple life sentences. Kalanach had spent his night reading the files. Seven counts of murder, all for organ harvesting purposes, and those were just the bodies that had been found. It was pretty clear that Rousseau hadn't started with those victims, though, and Interpol's internal memos theorised that thirty to forty was a more accurate estimate. A former surgeon in Italy, she had all the skills necessary for the practical side of the business, while her French husband had taken care of the administration. He'd been killed resisting arrest. Her only comment on the subject, reportedly, was how wasteful such a death was when her spouse's organs could have netted her in the region of half a million dollars. Jean-Paul and Kalanach waited for her, arms crossed, the chill air in the interview room only half the reason they felt so cold. Moretti Russo had never expressed a single regret for what she'd done, abducting men and women to specific racial and age specifications killing to order and making herself rich beyond most people's wildest dreams. With better self-control, she could have taken the money and run away to a non-extradition South American country and lived the rest of her life under the warm sun in luxury. But she'd wanted more. The woman who appeared in the doorway accompanied by a prison guard was an exception among Fleury Merogis lifers. Incarceration seemed to suit her. Now in her early sixties, she was slim but not skinny. Her skin looked as if she'd never missed a day of moisturising, and she walked straight back with a confidence that made Kalanach feel as if he were the inmate and she the visitor. But then she had nothing to lose, and they did. Gentlemen, she cooed, extending her hand regally, bent slightly at the wrist, as if they should kiss it. Jean-Paul stood up and opted for shaking it instead. Kalanach kept his seat, arms folded. Rousseau wanted them to acknowledge her as if she were a fellow professional, living life beyond the walls she'd made for herself, and he wasn't going to play her game. She sat down opposite them at the small table, crossing her long legs demurely at the ankles and tossing her dark, bobbed hair to one side. Kalanach saw she must have been an extraordinary beauty in her youth, obviously intelligent, used to getting her own way. She smiled at him with perfect teeth, marred only by a black space at the back. Kalanach couldn't help himself. Intrigued, he tipped his head further to the right to better view the aberration. Curious, she said, breathily, leaning towards him. Let me open my mouth for you. She did so slowly, running her pink tongue across her lower lip, drawing the moment out. Kalanach didn't stop her. This was part of her game, and he'd learned with narcissists that it was easier and more fruitful to let them play a while. Turning her head to the side, she slid a finger into her mouth, then pulled her cheek away to give him a better view. She'd lost a tooth, presumably while in prison or well, there was no doubt she'd have had a dentist fit a crown. You want to know how it happened, so let me spare you the embarrassment of such obvious interest. A woman, who'd been here for some time, in for kidnapping, I think, although I was too bored to bother with the details, decided she didn't like the way I held my head. She rather stupidly thought that trying to carve her initial into my face in the showers might be a good way of bringing me down to her level. 
Sally Forer, the shiv she'd secreted in her rectum, was slippery from the soap she used to get it out. My hands, expecting her as I was, were dry, so the shiv ended up in her temple rather than my cheek. During the altercation, she landed a punch that fractured my jaw, and my tooth was a casualty. But it was a small price to pay for the overall victory. She's in a special unit now, and every meal is provided to her by a plastic teaspoon while she listens to piped music from her wheelchair. Since then, my life here has been remarkably peaceful. Mrs. Moretti Rousseau, we are here to talk to you about a case, Jean-Paul began. I gather you were informed of that when we asked to speak with you. Did you have a chance to consult with your lawyer about the meeting? Call me Georgia, please, she said. That's not really appropriate, so if you don't mind, we'll... She cut across the attempt to maintain formality. You'll call me Georgia, and I'll call you by your first names, or we don't speak at all. My house, my rules. There's a very attractive young woman in my cell waiting to massage my feet, so don't think I don't have anywhere else to be. Of course. Jean-Paul didn't miss a beat. Kalanach wanted to leave. Georgia Moretti Russo was serpentine and calculating. I'm Jean-Paul, and this is Luke. We are grateful you agreed to see us. Do you mind if we use a voice recorder? Of course not. There'll have to be a deal, after all. I certainly want you to feel as if you're getting value for money. As Jean-Paul set up his voice recorder, she made a point of turning to Luke Kalanach full in the eyes, with a quick up-and-down sweep for good measure. Are you allowed to speak, or just here for security purposes? I speak as and when I feel the need, Kalanach replied. You don't like me. She tipped her head to one side. Did you expect me to? he asked, knowing she was drawing him in and wanting to resist but unwilling to let her dominate the conversation. I expect an Interpol agent to keep an open mind and judge based on his own perceptions rather than having an emotional reaction to a file of papers that tells only half a tale. Kalanach found a spot on the wall to stare at. She wanted him to look in her eyes and he wasn't going to give her the satisfaction. It was her eyes, in fact, that had led the police to her. With one light hazel pupil and the other dark brown, she was too recognisable for her own good, but too vain to have worn coloured lenses as a disguise. She was scouting for victims when she'd approached a plainclothes police officer. And that had been the end. Let's get started, shall we? Jean-Paul interrupted. You will have spoken to the governor already, of course, and agreed terms with him. She smoothed an eyebrow as she waited for Jean-Paul to open with an offer. Instead, he opened an envelope and began spreading photos of Malcolm Riley on the table, starting with three photos as he'd been in life, one in his ski gear, one taken at the gym, and another that had been downloaded from a social media post, Malcolm on holiday, shirtless, tanned on a beach. That stopped her in her tracks. She reached out her fingers slowly, manicured nails stroking the images. No body fat, she purred. Muscly, without bulk. He was, what, five foot nine? Jean-Paul checked his notes. Five ten, he confirmed. So you believe his organs were harvested, but you have no leads. How much of him was taken? Most of his major organs, Jean-Paul said, taking out the photos of Malcolm's body as it was discovered, followed by the post-mortem photographs. Georgia picked them up one by one, taking her time, sliding a slim pair of glasses from her pocket and putting them on. 
her movements self-conscious for the first time. She hated wearing them, Kalanach realised. It made her acknowledge ageing, and the glasses dulled the impact that her extraordinary eyes made, of course. The second she'd finished the examination, she slid the glasses back off, returning them to her pocket rather than leaving them on the table, where she would have had to see the space they occupied. Kalanach and Jean-Paul both knew better than to prompt. They sat silently, waiting for her to open up. She was enjoying the involvement and the attention. That much was clear from her demeanour. She leaned forward on the table, frowning, then closing her eyes, imagining the scenario that had eventually delivered Malcolm Riley into the hands of the pathologist, no doubt. Do you have the post-mortem report with you? she asked. I need more details on the incisions and the treatment of the blood vessels. The photos are good, but they are not the whole story. Jean-Paul passed it over. They sat in silence again as she read. Kalanach had read the documents so many times they were pretty much ingrained in his memory. The oral morphine wasn't difficult to get hold of. It was prescribed regularly to patients with conditions causing extreme pain, particularly those receiving end-of-life care at home. Pen, she ordered. Jean-Paul handed her a pencil in compliance with the governor's orders. Pens were too easily broken, sharpened, and turned into lethal weapons. Glasses back on, Georgia began underlining and dashing off notes in margins, drawing circles around certain words. Kalanach watched as she worked. This was a different woman, utterly focused and unaware of herself. She was less dislikable like that, he decided, her vanity replaced with an instinctual return to the professionalism that had marked her early days as a surgeon. This time when she was done, the glasses remained in place. She tapped her fingernails on the desk. It was strategy time. She was obviously intrigued and engrossed, but that wouldn't prevent negotiations. Best of her, in one go. Don't mess me around. And before you ask if I can help you or not, yes, I can. Your pathologist is good, but he is not a surgeon. So the insights are, being polite, lacking. A cell to yourself, no more sharing. An additional 60 minutes per day out of your cell in recreational areas. Your choice of jobs inside the prison. One extra visit per month, Jean-Paul announced. It wasn't a bad deal, but she was holding the cards and they all knew it. They'd expected her to ask for more, of course, but Jean-Paul hadn't held anything back. There was no point. Anything less than the offer he'd made wouldn't yield results. It was up to her to decide whether she wanted the little extras that the deal would give her. To a life prisoner, an extra hour a day out of her cell added up to an awful lot over the years. That's all, she directed at Kalanach, playing games again. He nodded. I'll need a week to think about it. Come back again in seven days. If I need more thinking time than that, I'll have the governor let you know. Don't bother with that, Kalanach said, stretching his legs out in front of him and keeping his shoulders loose. You don't want us to play games, and we don't want you to. You know there's a time issue. We know that life inside a prison, even with your skills at manipulating people, is dull. You may not find it scary anymore. You may have become accustomed to the crappy food, and perhaps there's a certain hierarchy that you've topped, but you're bored. An extra hour a day out of your cell, better access to all the people and information you need to maintain your status, is worth a lot. Georgia pushed her glasses to the top of her head. That, Kalanach realized, was what she did when she thought no one was watching her. It is, Luke, she purred. But there are other things I'd rather have. Name them, just out of interest. Our hands are tied as far as negotiating goes, Kalanach said. 
Much of my authority in here comes from my former job. I'm a good doctor. Whatever else I did wrong, no one could ever say my expertise was lacking. I want access to the latest medical journals to stay up to date. The library here says they are too expensive to stock and won't make the expenditure for me alone. Noted, Jean-Paul said. I can ask about that. And I like a stethoscope and an otoscope. It's designed for checking ears, but works just as well for other parts of the body. Neither instrument costs much. What for? Jean-Paul asked. What do you think? She snapped. Georgia took a deep breath and smiled. Apologies. I'm not used to being questioned. I run an informal clinic in here. It keeps my mind occupied. But there are limits, severe limits, to what I can do with no medical kit. There are doctors here. And for serious cases, inmates are referred to the hospital. I don't see the point, Jean-Paul said. Of course you don't. You are not used to waiting a month to see a doctor while your throat's getting sore, or your urinary tract infection gets so bad you can't piss without screaming. You're not used to having prison guards ask you for favors just so you can be referred to the medical center. You don't understand how it feels to be laughed at and told it's too bad when you're in pain. I offer a fast way to get medical advice. I even save the doctors here valuable time. I know when symptoms are serious, and I can pass that information on to the guards who are the most easily persuadable. Twice I've diagnosed signs of serious illness that the prison doctors had decided were malingering or hyperbole. One of those women got the treatment she needed, and the other at least got proper pain relief on the hospice bed to pass in peace. Not all monsters are useless. It's just a different set of rules. And what do you get in return? Kalanach asked. I'm guessing your enterprise isn't entirely altruistic. Cigarettes. I don't smoke, of course, but there are banknotes in here. Some women pay me in drugs, which I can then prescribe to others who need them for whatever their condition is. Favors, information, beauty treatments, the expertise of others. You'd be surprised how sophisticated this economic system is. The really big earner is the criminal lawyer convicted of tax fraud. Her cells never empty, as you can imagine. It'll be difficult, Jean-Paul said. Medical implements have metal parts. The governor will be concerned about safety and even more worried about his liability in allowing you to practice quasi-medicine with no license. There'll be an issue about getting sued. I'll sign an agreement to say I'm only allowed to perform research with the kit not to diagnose or treat fellow prisoners. I'll even keep a copy of it hanging on my cell wall for everyone to see. That'll stop the lawsuits. Do you think I haven't discussed this with my friend the lawyer already? She'd come in fully prepared, Kalanak thought. No doubt she'd been planning exactly this conversation from the second she was notified that Interpol had requested an interview. As for the danger posed by a stethoscope and an otoscope, I'd accept having them handed to me at certain times for a specific period and handing them back to a guard for safekeeping, say two hours a day, Monday to Friday. That way, it'll be obvious if I can't return them or if parts have been removed. Not that I'd allow that to happen. I do have some pride, you know. I'll ask, Jean-Paul said. I can do that right now, but the deal's off the table if you try to delay. Did you just grow some balls, Jean-Paul? she asked. I don't recommend speaking to me like that again, though. That might work 
with the drug importers and pedophile rings you normally deal with, but not with me. Kalanak guessed she was right. Her IQ was well beyond normal limits, even for a surgeon, and her sense of entitlement carried with it a stubbornness that was their most likely stumbling block. Give me a moment, Jean-Paul said. He knocked on the door for a guard to open up and went outside into the corridor. There, a phone call with the waiting governor was all that was required for authorization to do the deal or not. It would be a yes, Kalanak knew. Interpol didn't have carte blanche, but it still held enough sway to get what it wanted. Georgia waited until the door was locked again. There's some tension between the two of you, she observed. Kalanak didn't answer. Does he compare himself to you, do you think? He won't turn his body towards you fully when you speak. He won't allow himself to nod or show any normal signs of enthusiasm, even when you're working effectively. It's as if he's trying to cut himself off from you. You didn't give evidence at your trial. And yet, you'd easily have been a match for the prosecutor. Why did you opt for silence? Kalanach asked. She would immediately recognize the question for what it was, a change of subject. But he wasn't going to discuss Jean-Paul with her. Perhaps I wanted to end up in here, she said. You see things as black and white, which is what ampers most police investigations. There's an unwillingness to accept the humanity or the complexity of the perpetrators of crime. Most law enforcement personnel lack imagination. They're so caught up in right and wrong, justice, laws, that they fail to explore the evidence in ways that might be truly disturbing, as in this case. The organs are gone, therefore it must be harvesting. Simple, clean. Isn't it? he asked. Of sorts. Then again, not really. It's your face, isn't it? He hates that women can't stop staring at you. Being with you is a constant drain on him. It must be like being the less attractive twin. He's diminished by you. He's a little old for that, Kalanak said. We'll see, shall we? Jean-Paul re-entered the room. All right, he said. Your requests have been guaranteed. They're being reduced to writing and will be signed by the governor before we leave provided you supply us with valuable information. Fine, she said. I'll need your colleague to take off his shirt. She turned her head and gave Kalanak the tiniest wink at an angle hidden from Jean-Paul. No, Kalanak said. Georgia grinned. Purely for anatomical purposes... I need a specimen to show you how I'd have made the incisions. This is the easiest way without an anatomical dummy here. Jean-Paul gritted his teeth. Shut off, he growled. I'm not part of the deal, Kalanak said quietly. Apparently you are, Jean-Paul muttered. Kalanak had a choice. Continuing the argument would undermine Jean-Paul's authority in the room. Giving Georgia what she wanted was a backward step in the negotiations and gave her another reason to draw out the process she was already enjoying too much. He opted for the path of least resistance, gratuitous as it was, undoing his buttons, dropping his shirt on the chair and standing up. I need a pen, not a pencil. I'll be drawing on your colleague. Georgia grinned at Jean-Paul, who sighed but took a pen from the inside pocket of his jacket and handed it over. 
Kalanach took a moment to consider how much of a threat the pain was. Shoved into his eye or his neck, it could kill him. Yet Jean-Paul had handed it over without argument. You can relax, Georgia told him. You're too pretty to kill. Not a consideration you gave some of your other victims, Kalanach said, as she turned him so his chest was facing the single light in the centre of the room. Ah, but then there was money involved. Now it would just be gratuitous killing. That's something I could never be accused of. She ran her fingers down his chest, pressing on the breastbone, feeling the curve of his ribcage and back up to where she left her fingers over his heart. You have a very slow heartbeat, she said. You must keep fit. Watch that, though. You'll have problems with low blood pressure if you're not careful. Can we start? Jean-Paul asked. Georgia raised one arrogant eyebrow at Kalanach, making it clear she'd won their earlier argument. Kalanach looked away. All right, she said, sliding her glasses back on and looking across the table to where the photos of Malcolm Riley's opened chest and abdominal cavity lay. Let's begin. She positioned the pen at the top of Kalanach's chest and drew a single downward stroke from the top of his breastbone to the top of his pubic bone. This was the first incision. Single cut all the way. Then the second cut was made across the abdominal cavity. If the abdominal cut was made first, there would have been some snagging as the vertical incision hit the wound, and there's none reported. There is, however, a tiny additional nick at the cross point of the right hand section of the abdominal incision. She drew one line across the right side of Kalanach's abdomen, left a space to show where the snag was, then completed the right hand section. You're assuming that these organs were all harvested at once. Obviously, if the donor is deceased, you take all the usable organs as quickly as possible. Multiple surgeons on a team, everyone conscious of the ticking clock, putting whatever you can into storage for transportation. It's all done under pressure and because there are no options. Also, it's a relatively simple, clean process because without the heart pumping, you have less to concern yourself with in terms of blood loss, the cavities filling up, no need to tie off the arteries, and so on. My experience was different. I performed organ transplant operations on patients who were still alive, kidneys, liver sections, and once a single testicle. And I can tell you that the less damage you do while you operate, the healthier the organs will be when they're transplanted into the new host. For this reason, it only makes sense to perform the operation initially to remove any organs that can be removed without a threat of loss of life. It also allows you to deal with those organs and repair the damage one organ at a time. There's a reason for that. Black markets operate differently to regulated medical practices. There's an upfront fee, a sort of booking cost. A second payment when the organ is delivered and transplanted, and a final payment is due if the organ has not been rejected after 28 days. Perfectly good commercial practice, and it means the surgeon works harder to do everything possible not to allow the organ to become overly starved of blood or damaged by trauma during the operation. Did your tox screen show anything like propofol, pentobarbital, or thiopental in his system? Only liquid morphine in his stomach, which would have killed his pain. But it's not a proper anesthetic. It's almost impossible 
to control anesthesia through oral drugs. If he had come around, the surgical team would have been in trouble. So they were intent on taking everything in one go. If they were going to take organs over a longer period, they'd have used one of the drugs I mentioned to keep him in a medically induced coma. How would you have harvested the organs? Kalanach asked. Well, I'd have kept this stress away from the art as long as possible and minimized surgical entry until the very end. I'd have started with the testicles and then I'd have gone into the abdomen. She drew a short line across Kalanach's stomach. Liver first, as it's so large, and I'd have wanted it out of the way, followed by pancreas and gallbladder. For a kidney, I prefer to make an incision in the side, just below the ribcage. It's a cleaner removal system. Now, by the time you get to the lungs, the lack of medical knowledge becomes more stark. A thoracotomy to remove a lung is properly performed by way of a horizontal incision across the chest, positioned more towards the arm on the left side where the lung is positioned against the art. She made a mark several inches long below Kalanach's left pectoral muscle, which tells me that they took the art first as they went in through the central chest incision. Obviously, by this stage, your young man was dead, anyway. Eyes last. Mess around with the brain, like that, at the outset, and the patient goes into shock, and the organs would start to degrade too fast, particularly without proper anesthesia. So, it could be organ harvesting, John Paul said. Badly done by an inexperienced surgeon or someone with some medical knowledge attempting to rip customers off, not concerned about whether or not the organs were rejected by the new host. If they didn't have a contract with a final payment, that would make them less likely to be careful, right? It's possible, Georgia agreed. She patted Kalanak on the chest as if he were a pet. Jean-Paul rolled his eyes. You can sit down now, darling. What you two don't understand is the market. You don't put an ad in the local paper, you know? I located my hosts, my clients, through their doctors. Real doctors, with licenses and good reputations, who are more than willing to drop my name into the conversation for clients who are out of time and hope. You never gave up their names to the prosecution, Jean-Paul noted. And I destroyed every contact I had with every one of them, digital or on paper. Why did those men and women deserve to be ruined just because I'd been caught? They were doing their best for their patients, exactly what the brief is when you go into medicine. You killed people, Kalanach reminded her. For money. For every person I killed, my work enabled an average of six other people to live. So if, for example, I killed ten people, I saved sixty. I should have been given a reward, not imprisoned. Kalanach stared at her. You were only convicted of seven, Jean-Paul reminded her. How sweet she replied. Kalanak knew she believed it on some level. Not that she didn't appreciate what she'd done wrong, but her self-justification was genuine. We were talking about the doctors in your, uh, referral scheme, John Paul reminded her. Ah, yes, well, we contacted them, discreetly, of course, and let them know that we might have organs available. There was a convoluted system for them to contact us in return, in case any of them notify the police, but they all had one thing in common. Wealthy clients with failing organs, who 
we'd been on waiting lists long enough to have lost hope. The organ donation system doesn't work effectively in spite of recent attempts to impose a scheme where people are assumed to be in until they opt out. People are dying needlessly on a daily basis. We were oversubscribed at times. For a couple of organs, we actually held auctions. That was my downfall, before you feel the need to point it out to me. The doctor who lost the auction was the one who contacted the police and gave evidence against you? Kalanach asked. Indeed, she said. But what I was trying to explain is that we had carefully established systems. In our arrogance, we assumed them foolproof, but they were good. We made contact with the right doctors. They checked me out. They gave very specific information regarding donor types, blood types, age groups. There was no amateur element to what we did. We ran a private hospital to all intents and purposes. My husband hired premises under a false company name. Then we'd kit out the operating theaters and recovery rooms with the best equipment, engage experienced staff, and I performed both ends of the transplant. We paid cash everywhere we went. No one asks questions when you are paying a little extra and they don't have to wait for money to transfer. We were good at what we did because we knew what we were doing. The relevance? John Paul asked. The relevance, obviously, is that whoever is performing the surgery in this case, while they have some medical knowledge, the incision is correct in depth so the organs could have been successfully removed, is no expert, no professional anesthesia, incisions that do not maximize operability. Any doctor they contacted would check them out immediately and tell their patient not to go anywhere near an organ offered by such a provider. Taking such a risk would only hasten death, not prolong it. Jean-Paul wrote lengthy notes on a pad while Georgia perused her own markings on the copy of the post-mortem report. What else? Kalanach asked, noting the smile playing at the corners of her mouth. Some basics. I really need to examine the body myself to be clinically certain, but it looks unlikely that whoever operated left sufficient lengths of blood vessels attached to make for an easy transplant at the recipient end. But they chose their donor well. Someone did research. He was healthy, a non-smoker, no obvious alcohol use, no sign of disease, fit, no body fat. I couldn't have chosen better myself. So he'd have made a good donor. But you're saying harvesting wasn't what this was about? Jean-Paul threw his pen on the desk. I'm telling you, is good marketing material. You choose the donor to make the sale as easy as possible, same as any other product you're trying to sell. The question is, what they were selling precisely, if not organs for transplant, Kalanak said, doing up the last button of his shirt. The governor appeared at the door with a sheet of paper in his hand, looking as relaxed as if he were about to join them for coffee. Dr. Moretti Rousseau, he greeted her with respect. I'm so glad you've been able to assist our friends from Interpol. That was good of you. If you're finished, you can check this agreement and we'll both sign it. I don't know. She smiled and ran a hand through her hair. Do you think I'm finished? She asked Luke and Jean-Paul. I think we're done here. Jean-Paul stood up, gathering the photos and report from the table. What is it? Kalanach asked her. 
Do you have faith in me? Georgia replied. I accept your expertise. Cold fish. She smiled. Offer me something else. You won't regret it. I'm afraid this is the best we can do, the governor interjected. We literally haven't the staff or resources to make any further concessions. Shame. You heard my expert opinion. No one thought to ask me about my gut instinct. Well, that could be anything, Jean-Paul said. We're after hard leads, not fairy tales. But the fairy tale is what's going to help you, Georgia said. Last chance. She turned her back on Jean-Paul and the governor, standing directly in front of Kalanach instead. Your choice. Have a crown fitted to replace the missing tooth, or have your eyes lasered so you can lose the glasses. I'll secure funding, he directed at the governor. What the fuck? Jean-Paul sighed. Shut up, Georgia told him. Tell me which one I'm going to choose and why. Then we have a deal. Kalanak didn't hesitate. You'll choose the eyes, the tooth, you carry like a badge of honor. It's a war wound that secures your position in here. Repair it, and you'll lose credibility because it looks like it was bothering you. The problem with your vision is that you hate it because you feel it diminishes you. Visible aging reduces your prowess, both to others and for you internally. More psychoanalysis than I was expecting, or wanted, but fine. Added to the agreement. Kalanach picked up a pen and took hold of the contract, scribbling an additional note at the bottom and adding his own signature to it before both Georgia and the governor added their own. Jean-Paul held out his hand for Georgia to return the pen. She did so slowly, with a faint smile. Your turn, Kalanach told Georgia, as Jean-Paul secured the pen in his pocket. All right, she said, taking both his hands in her own and staring up at him like a teenage girl waiting for her first kiss. Kalanach tolerated the touch of the hands that had killed in cold blood and waited. What's the one thing you'll need more than anything else in life that's personal to you? Something that has become so important to you, it's close to an obsession. There isn't anything, he said blankly. Yes, there is. Everyone has something. For me, it's liberty. I think about it constantly, even when I'm not conscious of it. An hour later, I realize I was reliving a walk on some beach, step by step. For the governor, it's time with his daughters. When you're in his office, he barely looks at you. He stares at the photo of him with them, loses track mid-conversation, sometimes calls people by their names by mistake. Do I? The governor asked softly. Think about it. It's important, Georgia told Kalanach. He hesitated, threw a half-glance in Jean-Paul's direction before he could stop himself. Being believed, he said. Georgia took in a sharp breath. I wish I could ask why, but your colleague has decided I'm wasting time, so here you go. People will do anything sacrifice anything to get the one thing that means the most to them. It makes them vulnerable. More than anything else, it makes them stupid. Why did your victim's air smell of myrrh? We don't know that yet, he said. She nodded her head. Historically, he's been used for embalming, Jean-Paul offered. Was your victim embalmed? She replied. Uh, no. But, uh, Jean-Paul said quietly. 
then it wasn't being used for its embalming qualities. The myrrh is what you need to figure out. There's more than one type of doctor in the world, Luke. Some of us use tried and tested medicine. Others operate with smoke and mirrors, mirror and myth. She dropped his hands, although her touch remained icy on his palms. I'm ready to go back to my cell now, she told the governor. He gave her a slight dip of his head and knocked once on the door for the guard to open up. Chapter 13 Ava had taken the opportunity to leave the station, arriving at the farm in Roslyn at the same moment Detective Constable John Swift exited Lively's car, misplaced his footing in the mud, and fell flat on his face in a combination of wet earth and animal excrement. She winced, decided against offering him a hand up, given the state he was in, and the likelihood that she too might end up on the ground and waited for our sergeant to deliver the inevitable stinging verbal assault. The farmer saved lively the trouble. Is he some sort of clown you bring along to lighten the atmosphere when human bodies are discovered? The farmer asked. Ava didn't engage. This way, then. We Bobo there can follow the footprints when he's got himself upright. The other lot are already getting set up. He pointed to the scene examiner's vehicle parked next to a distant barn. Lively walked at Ava's side. I like him already. Lively motioned at the farmer, who was striding off across the field. Maybe he was separated at birth, Ava muttered. They arrived at the pig enclosures to be handed clean suits by the forensics team. Ava and Lively slipped theirs on easily as D.C. Swift struggled to pull one over his muddy clothes. Not to judge, ma'am, but how did the inappropriately named Constable Swift find his way into MIT? Did he get lost on the way to the bogs and just forget to leave again? Give him time, Sergeant. He might be a diamond in the rough. Oh, aye. He'll be the genius who solves this entire case just as soon as he's learned how to walk. What are you doing here anyway, if you don't mind my asking? But premature, isn't it? Human bones in pig pens? There's only ever one explanation for that. She climbed a fence and trod carefully, keeping to the hard mats the examining team had put through the mud to minimise disruption to the scene. We don't even know if the bones are human yet. I'm not sure the farmer's qualified to be making that assessment unless he's angling for a job at the mortuary. Farmers may not see many human bones, but they see plenty from animals. Makes sense to me that these stood out. A tenor says you've overthought it and we're wasting our time. Lively held out his hand for Ava to shake. I'd happily just pay you a tenor to scrub your nails more thoroughly, Ava smiled. Put your gloves on and help DC Swift into his suit. I'm not sure he ever learned how to do zips. It's definitely human a forensics officer said, walking up and holding out a section of skull for them to view. Damn it, Ava said. How long's it been here? I'm not sure exactly, but at least two, possibly three bodies were dumped here. Come with me. They trod along the plastic matting to the edge of one pig pen, where yellow flags poked their weaving heads from the muck. This skull section was found here, you can see there's another section of skull still in situ. We want to excise the surrounding mud to see if there's human tissue which would help us get a more precise time on the body's arrival. How do you know the bones aren't all from the same individual? Swift piped up from behind them. Well, the scene examiner said slowly, as you can see, the skull section in my hand has the right eye socket still intact? Compare it with the skull section sticking out of the ground, and you'll note that one has both eye sockets still intact. So unless our victim had three eyes... Moving on, Ava said quietly, talking over Lively, who was swearing under his breath and shaking his head. You said you think there might be a third body? Next pen over, she pointed 
We can't go in there yet as we want to preserve the scene first, both to understand the pig's movements and to protect whatever trace evidence there might be in the mud. We're about to cover it with a tent before the rain starts again. The bone was spotted from beyond the fence at the other side. There's no skull, but we've seen what we believe to be part of a clavicle. It's small and thin, more likely to belong to a female or a child, but that's preliminary. And there's something else. Follow me back out. There's a better view from the far side of the pens. They retraced their steps, Ava grabbing Lively's hand as he reached out to slap Swift around the back of the head, before traipsing in increasingly deep mud to stand at a fence where a variety of farmyard machinery had been dumped in front of another pig pen. Stand up on the lowest fence rung, the forensics officer instructed them. Carefully, Lively instructed Swift. The better view showed several more yellow flags over a wide area, just under a wooden fence where a considerable disturbance had been made in the mud, creating a large dip. When we arrived, the farmer had moved the pigs out of the pen we were just in, but what drew our attention was the behaviour of the pigs in the pen you can see from here. There were several of them gathered around the dip in the mud, pushing their snouts up against the fence, clearly fighting each other to get to whatever was this side. We investigated and found the bone next to what appears to be a section of trachea, up to the larynx. It's fairly distinctive. You think they pushed it under the fence while they were consuming the remainder of the body? Eva asked. That's the theory. In the other pen, the boards go right down into the earth. Here, because there's the machinery area to keep the pigs in, the fence has a gap at the bottom. No doubt at all that they'd already have consumed that trachea if they'd had the opportunity. Can smell food a metre down, my girls, the farmer declared from behind them. Any idea how long it would have taken them to consume a whole human? Eva asked him. Am I no a suspect, then? The farmer asked her. You will have to make a statement, of course, and we'll need the names of everyone who works here or has access to the area. Any suspicious vehicles or people on your land? But I doubt you'd have called us in if this was your handiwork. Bloody right. And there's been no one suspicious I've seen and that have ended up on the pointy end of my shotgun the farmer told them. There were three sows in each pen. An average body would be gone in less than half a day. A full day if it was a really big man. Tested that, have ye? Lively asked. If I didn't know what quantity of food my pigs consumed daily after twenty years farming, I wouldn't be much good at my job now, would I? Do they eat anything, then? Swift asked. The sections of skull are left over because that's the hardest part for the pigs to bite through, just because of the shape. Left long enough, even the skulls would have gone, with the pigs working on the edge of the skull until it cracked and fell apart. We're sifting the mud in each pen now for teeth. Those don't break down in the pigs' stomachs, so they'll give us a good baseline for when the bodies were dumped. If they've already expelled the teeth, the bodies would have been consumed more than 36 hours ago which is the average adult sow's metabolic rate. Given the full day it takes to consume a human, you could roughly time the bodies to have been brought here about two and a half days ago. And yes, she directed at Swift, pigs are the ultimate body disposal system. Human DNA is no longer recognisable after it's been through a pig's stomach. We're lucky we got the trachea, and the chance of getting any positive identification would have been virtually nil. They eat the soft bits first, the scene examiner added. So, all the future pig shit needs to be checked to see when they pass the teeth, Lively asked. That's your problem, the farmer announced. Each pig is in a separate indoor pen. We'll check each one on a daily basis until we're confident that all the teeth have been gathered. We don't want them outside until we give you the all clear, so the teeth won't be affected by any uncontrollable elements, the examiner explained. Well, guess I won't need to feed them for a day or so, the farmer said, nodding as he left them to it. You'd think he didn't care at all, Swift commented, as the farmer disappeared around the side of the barn. 
He raises, feeds, and kills animals for a living, Lively said. Circle of life and all that. I'm guessing he's not a sentimentalist. You were definitely separated at birth, Ava said. What'll happen to the bone fragments now? They'll be delivered to a forensic anthropologist. I'll email you the details. You can talk to them directly for their findings. The trachea will go to the deputy pathologist for inspection. Samples will be taken, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for a DNA match. Constable, go after the farmer and take his statement, please, Ava said. Swift looked happy to be leaving the conversation as the scene examination officer excused herself to rejoin her team. The bodies are piling up. Something's not right. Lively nodded. Malcolm Riley in France. Three unidentified here. It's a lot, but it's not unknown. These three might have been dead for a year or more. We've also got Gene Oldman in Wester Hills, Ava reminded him. Gene Oldman pissed the wrong person off, and I suspect the cue to do that might have gone round the block. Whoever shot him in his own kitchen and didn't even bother covering his body isn't the same person who went to these links to get rid of evidence. The sudden influx of bodies is a coincidence. These things don't space themselves out considerately over the year. Ava turned away from the pig pens, looking across the hills at the view. It was breathtaking. Roslyn had become a tourist hub for Roslyn Chapel, but that wasn't all the area had to offer. There wasn't another building in sight from where she stood. Not that many pig farms around here, she noted. Most Scottish pig farming happens further north. Nice secluded farm, too. Not overlooked. Pig pens in the barns were a good distance from the farmhouse. Clever. Bugger to get the bodies here, though. Lively noted. Not if they cut them up first, which would have made consumption easier. There's enough information about it on the internet that it wouldn't take a criminal mastermind to figure it out. Messy, though, and risky. How could they be sure the farmer wouldn't have disturbed them or found the bodies before they could be eaten? If it were me, I'd have been watching the farmer first, Ava said. Check what time the lights go off in the farmhouse at night. Move the bodies in immediately it gets dark. Give the pigs maximum overnight consumption time. If they were armed, they might not have been too bothered about the farmer's shotgun. There must have been more than one person getting three bodies into the pens. I'd have kept one man back to keep an eye on the farmer's door, make sure he didn't get suspicious from the noise of the pigs. Then had maybe two others, three even, dumping the bodies out there. It gets dark early at the moment. They'd have had in the region of twelve hours dark or dusk to get it done. Chop up the bodies into small enough chunks and streamline the process. That's what I'd have done. Should I be worried about you? Lively asked. Too much time on my hands, Ava said, as she turned her head back into the city. She couldn't be late. Natasha was waiting for her at the hospital. Chapter 14 Elenuta sat quietly on the kitchen floor eating her lunch. It was pot noodles again, cheap and easy to store, and they seemed never to degrade no matter how out of date they were, which was safer than the questionable meat Finley occasionally turned up with. Last time, four of the women in the flat had been sick for days after eating what they'd been told was pork. The smell of it had put Elenuta off, and her refusal to eat it had meant all other meal options had been taken off the table for the day. It had been a lucky call. Most days, she was so hungry she took whatever she could get. The process of eating was part muscle memory, part fakery right now. As hard as she tried to ignore Finlay's laptop after he'd done what he wanted to her, then fallen asleep, she'd sneaked back over to it. She'd noticed the email icon at the bottom of the screen while she'd been watching with Finlay earlier. She checked over her shoulder, but Finlay was still dribbling in his sleep. Clicking twice on the tiny envelope symbol, she tried to recall any email address she knew. Her parents, her best friend, even businesses she'd connected with in the past. Enter password, the screen had demanded. Elenuta's heart had sank. She tried the internet search symbol, imagining finding any website with a chat function where she could ask for help. 
Same result. Only the video gallery and a few stupid games were accessible. Absolutely fucking typical. Access to a laptop, and all she could do with it was watch more of the same horrors she was living through. Still, someone had to bear witness. With the volume switched off, so as not to wake the sleeping monster, she'd watched the remainder of the race, and for every conscious minute since, she'd wished she hadn't. The girl had died, as Elenuta had known she would, her back to the wall, pinned by the tattooed man who'd roared his self-approval, banging his chest as he'd let her fall to the floor, stomping around like some triumphant hero. Then the drone camera had swapped over to highlight the race's former winner. Reality TV in its most extreme form of evolution, she thought. The woman heard a noise in the corridor behind her, whipping her head round, freezing, eyelids stretched as high as they would rise. Then she was off again, sprinting forwards, racing away from her pursuer, looking much fitter than anyone living in Finley's gear had a right to. She rounded a corner, one hand pushed out against the far wall for balance, looking lithe and strong. That was when she ran full force into the race's largest champion, knees still bleeding from his earlier encounter. She was a head taller than him, and obviously fitter, but she was no match for his bulk or his rage. Her own forward momentum worked against her, and he grabbed one of her arms and her body twisted, falling sideways to the floor, her head hitting off the concrete with a crack that Elenuta could imagine in surround sound, even if the volume was off. The woman tried to get back up, but staggered, flat on her face, as the big man climbed on top of her, already pulling off his shorts. Elenuta looked away, steeled herself, watched again. After everything she'd been through, the violence, imprisonment, and daily sexual assaults, the terrible, sickening truth was that seeing another woman raped had become just a day in the life. Hours of hearing the women in rooms either side of her crying, screaming, calling out, had desensitized her. She simply had to wait for the scene to end. When he'd finished using her, he grabbed his previously discarded trousers and stuffed them into her mouth pinching her nose. She fought hard, thrashed for more minutes than Elenuta realised it took a person to die from suffocation and eventually lost consciousness. Still, he didn't move, just continued to lie on top of her. Perhaps, Elenuta thought, he realised how he would look to everyone watching through drone vision, his now flaccid penis flopping pathetically as he retrieved his trousers and put them back on. Or maybe he was prolonging the moment, his one great triumph over the female gender, revenge for every real or perceived slight, every rejection, sating not only his sexual desires but bringing every hate-filled thought bursting into glorious technicolour. Whoever was directing the action finally grew bored. The scene shifted again. The screen now split fifty-fifty, and two women could be seen. The one who had previously armed herself with the glass was taking stock, standing still, listening, no doubt, to the silence following the previous winner's death. With each scream, Elenuta realised, there would come a guilt feast of relief and delight that another woman had been caught and that you were still alive to fight or run. Another woman, just like you, who you might have shared a room or a flat with, who might have tried to distract an angry guard or client to spare you from another fist. That woman's death had just increased your own chance of survival. Good luck sleeping with that in your head. The other woman still standing was huddled in a corner. Elenita didn't like her chances. The adrenaline that had got her moving at the start of the race was obviously used up. The man with the scar down his stomach came into view. He stood still a moment as he spied the woman, gave a brief shake of his head as if to say how sad it was that the game had come to such a pathetic end. She put her hands up in the air, slightly in front of her, her lips moving rapidly, cheeks shining with tears. 
There would be no fight. Elinuta knew. Plenty of begging, but not enough resistance to make a difference. The scarred man stepped forward slowly, taking his time. The smile on his face, that of an uncle Elinuta had as a child, who brought her sweets, played games, and slid his hand up her skirt whenever her parents weren't looking. When she threatened to tell, he threatened to move on to her younger sister. That smile was everything. A mask, a casual indifference, a confidence, a promise of worse to come. Elinuta put a hand over her mouth to keep from waking Finlay up. As the scarred man reached the woman, he held out a hand to her. A suitor in a twisted universe. The woman looked horrified. Then, worse, hopeful, and reached out her own shaking hand, laying her slim fingers on his palm. And that was that. He pulled her forward into his arms, kissing her cheek softly, then turned her around, her back to his chest, pulling her clothing away. She didn't fight him. Her head was flopped against his neck, her bare chest fluttering with insubstantial breaths, eyes blinking madly. The scarred man dipped a hand into his pocket, bringing out a silver blade that flashed in the overhead lighting, teasing its presence. She closed her eyes. Elinuta forced hers to stay open. The man held the blade aloft, making a play of it in the air before the drone that was edging closer to get the audience its best view of the final action. The woman was limp in the man's arms, hands at her sides, feet rooted to the concrete. The man lowered the knife, sliding one hand beneath the woman's left breast, lifting it to expose its pale underside, positioning the knife parallel to the underside. The woman's mouth fell open. What was about to happen, written as clearly on her face as if she had typed the actual words. The knife held no quick death for her. What if one breast was not enough for him? What if he didn't stop it too, but decided other body parts were fair game? The dread shone in her eyes. The drone buzzed a little nearer, and the scarred man stared at it. He lifted the knife away, pointing the blade into the lens. Shall I do it? he roared, his mouth so large and clear Elinuta could read his lips. It took no imagination at all to hear the crier's response. The next movement was a blur. The woman grabbed, finding her strength when she needed it most, taking hold of the man's wrist. She stepped or perhaps fell forwards. Turning the knife, she directed it at the side of her neck, letting her body weight fall into it. The crimson stream was evidence of her good aim. The man held her for ten seconds, then her dead weight got the better of him. His triumphant roar became a cry of frustration. As she hit the ground, he kicked once, twice, three times, but by then her head was lolling, the slowly spreading patch on the ground a river of her relief. Kneeling across her, the man took back his knife and the blood flowed faster. He stabbed out his impotent fury in her already dead body. Elinuta smiled and cried as he vented. In the second screen, Finlay had found the last woman standing, still clutching her makeshift glass weapon, and was holding up her arm to proclaim her victorious. Her face was pale. She shook as he touched her, tried to pull away. Couldn't resist watching the finale, eh? Elinuta cried out, falling backwards onto the floor, hands out in front, both a plea and a defence against whatever was coming. Sorry, she cried. We'll not touch the laptop again. Finlay stopped the video and slammed down the lid. You're fucking right, you won't, bitch. You're not going to be pressing any buttons at all with no hands. I've got a nice sharp knife waiting for you in the kitchen. It'll slice right through your wrists, no problem at all. The only bits of you I need to leave intact are your mouth and your pussy. The flat doorbell rang. Please. So sorry. Elinuta sobbed. So sorry. There was a pause before the bell rang again, this time for longer. 
Answer the fucking door, motherfuckers! Finlay yelled, before looking back down at Elenuta. Tell you what, we'll play a game. If whoever's at the door is a good client who pays properly and leaves a tip, you'll keep your hands. If it's some nosy bastard neighbour of those balls aching Jehovah's, you won't be hitting any target smaller than an elephant's arsehole for the rest of your natural. He stood up and pulled Elenuta up next to him, slapping her backside hard enough to leave finger marks. And the next time I fuck you, you'll look me in the eyes and say thank you like a good girl. Got it? She nodded. Say it, then, he whispered, his mouth millimetres from hers. Thank you, she gasped. Thank you. Finlay smiled and went to see who was at the door. Chapter 15 Ava's mobile rang. It's Luke, she told Natasha. I'll call him back later. Nonsense, take it. We've nothing else to do but wait for a bloody big needle to be stuck in me. Ava's thumb hovered over the reject call button. Does he know? Ava shook her head. I'd be meaning to tell him, but with him being in Paris... Natasha leaned over and took the phone from Ava's hand, answering the call on speakerphone. Luke, it's Tasha, she said. Ava's too important to answer her own phone these days, so I'm doing it for her. Natasha. His voice was warm. She's not making you cook for her too, is she? I keep trying. I'm not sure she eats at all these days. I have a horrible feeling she's gone back to student-style cuisine. How's Paris? I want to hear all about it. You should visit me here, he said. Maybe not until I've made some progress on this case, though. What are you two doing? I can't remember the last time Ava was away from her desk before 5 p.m. We're at the hospital, actually, Natasha said. Ava's keeping me company. A doctor walked in, raising a hand in greeting as he flipped through a file. Nothing serious, I hope, he said. Ava can fill you in. I've got to go. Mustn't keep the doctor waiting. I'll pass you to Ava. Sit in the street cafe and drink a pastis for me, okay? She passed the mobile over, and Ava switched off speaker, standing up and making for the door. I won't be long, she told Natasha. Luke, it's me. I'm in the corridor, but I can't be long. What's up? Is Natasha all right? He asked. Haven't got the time, she snapped, harder than she'd meant to. Any progress on Malcolm Riley? Of sorts. We're ruling out a professional organ harvesting setup at least in the traditional sense. We saw a sort of expert in the field who gave us some insights. A sort of expert? Doesn't sound very scientific. Is that the best Interpol can do? Well, she's a surgeon who specialised in transplant medicine till she started an off-the-record venture with her husband. After that, I suppose you'd more accurately call her a serial killer. She knows her stuff, though. Not just the medical stuff, but the black market. Okay, Ava said, pulling change out of her pocket and wandering down the corridor to a nearby drinks machine. So did she give you any leads? She ploughed a few coins into the slot. More advice than leads. We're focusing on potential end users for the organs. There'll have been marketing, maybe even an auction. Markham Riley's hair smelled of myrrh. There's a possibility it was a sort of ritual killing. Our expert's last suggestion was that there are different types of doctors out there, so... Which doctors? Ava pulled her coffee from the machine and blew on it. I didn't realise that there was much of that happening in Paris. Are you sure you're not going off on a tangent? At this stage, we're pleased to have a tangent. We think Malcolm O'Reilly was chosen specifically for his fitness and physique. It looks like he was profiled, which is something you'll need to check out at your end. It wasn't a random choice. He disappeared after a trip to the gym. His father thinks Malcolm had a woman there he was interested in. 
Eva explained. Well, that sounds like the priority follow-up. We're heading into some of the less mainstream communities to see if anyone's heard of organs being offered for sale. We may have another problem. A missing male, similar type, no contact for several days now, just disappeared after work. Fit, healthy, non-smoker, no drug use. Out of character not to go home. A couple of years younger than Malcolm. We've been treating it as a possible link so far. Raise the priority, Kalanak said, and send me the missing person's file. Have you put out a port's notice? Already done, Eva said. I should go. Hey, he said softly. I know your voice better than that. Tell me what's going on. She sighed. Is it bad? It's breast cancer, she said, choking on the final word and spilling coffee on the floor. Kalanach was quiet for a long time. Eva waited for him to formulate a next question. How bad? Stage two. They're operating again this afternoon. They took the lamp out already, but after some tests they want to take more tissue. The doctors are doing their best to save the breast, but... She took a deep breath and tried to steady her voice. You know how it goes, one day at a time. Natasha's being Natasha, and I think that's worse. I sort of wish she'd break down because I'd know how to deal with that. I'm a shitty friend, right? You're more like her sister than her friend. And she wouldn't want anyone else with her except you, Kalanak said. I wish I was there. Me too, Ava said quietly. I need to go back in while they prep her for surgery. Call my mobile if you need me. I'll be here a few hours more, but I'll go when I know she's round from the anaesthetic. She'll be kept in for at least another day. I'm so sorry. She befriended me for no other reason than I was new to Edinburgh and working with you. And she never once made me feel like I was anything other than a lifelong mate. I can't believe I'm not there for her, he said. Hug her from me and say my love, okay? Eva sniffed, then cleared her throat. I will. She ended the call wiped her eyes, threw the remains of the coffee into a bin and went back in to hold her best friend's hand, hoping she would never have to let go. Chapter 16 Bart Campbell stared at the ceiling. He was in a small room with a comfortable enough single bed. The lights turned off and on from the outside, and he could hear other voices in the corridor occasionally although his view through the ten-by-ten-inch ten toughened glass pane in the door was limited. It hadn't been a cell originally. A long mark on the wall indicated that a desk had stood there for some time. Boarding had been fitted over the exterior of a window, which suggested they were trying to stop him from getting out, rather than preventing others from getting in. It was quiet outside. Few traffic noises, no passing pedestrians, no music or industrial sounds. A meal was delivered three times a day. Breakfast was yogurt and fruit. Lunch was salad or soup. Dinner was lean protein and vegetables, all low-fat and healthy, with minimal carbs. He was going to lose weight fast, but he could survive on it. He'd eaten all of it, and it had tasted fine. He'd long since stopped worrying about poison. The people who delivered his meals appeared only briefly wearing white balaclavas and never spoke. The white balaclavas had freaked him out initially. They were supposed to be dark-coloured, surely. When had anyone in a movie ever turned up in a white balaclava? Where did you even get them? They didn't look homemade. When the van he'd been transported in had arrived at wherever he was, he'd been blindfolded and walked into the building. The space where they'd parked had been vast, every footstep echoing. With one man on each arm, hands tied behind his back, he'd been guided forward until the breeze on his face had subsided and a door had slammed behind him. There was the click-thump of a lock being secured, then another voice, 
this time a woman, issuing orders in French. She'd sounded older than him, perhaps his mother's age, and insistent. He'd been moved on again, deeper into the building. The floor had clacked as he'd walked. He'd heard other voices, some whispering as he'd passed them. Then he'd turned into another corridor. More locks, more pausing, and a sharp chemical odour had hit him. Not like a hospital exactly, definitely undertones of bleach, but a curious concoction of the acidic and the sulfuric. The stale waft of air that hadn't been freshened by open windows. Finally, in his own room, a new mattress smell, as if the plastic cover had only just been removed. That was when he'd heard the crying for the first time. A woman, young but not a child, weeping more than crying, he'd realised when he listened hard, as if she was too tired to cry hard any longer. Then a white balaclava had entered and told him to take off his clothes. He'd done as he was told. There were enough locked doors between Bart and the exit to make fighting and running for it a ridiculous choice. He was told to stand at the back of the room, draw himself up to his full height, being kidnapped makes you slouchy, he'd thought, and photographed. Same thing, but the back view, then to each side. Finally, with his arms in the air, and instructed to flex his muscles. After that, they'd put away the camera and taken out a tape measure and set of scales. Every conceivable measurement was recorded, from skull to feet. He'd lost weight, no surprise there. Finally, three bottles of water were delivered to his bedside table and he was told to drink them before sleeping, as the white balaclava murmured something about him being dehydrated. He was given escorted access to a bathroom with a shower, where soap, a toothbrush and toothpaste were provided. Who the hell needed their captive to brush their teeth, he had wondered, as he'd scrubbed the grime of his journey away and tried to persuade himself that at some point he would understand what was happening to him. At last, he'd been returned to his room, left alone, the corridor, dark. Bart! A girl's voice hissed across the few metres of void between them. Hey, you awake? He stopped the memory short and walked to his door. If he stood at the far right-hand edge of the small window, he could just make out her door, and the swing of her blonde hair in the far edge of her own window. Just. Glimpsing more of her had proved impossible. If either of them moved so that their face was on view, they couldn't see far enough down the corridor themselves to make contact. Seeing that hair, those long, if blurred, swinging strands, was the closest he'd come to feeling sane since waking up on the container ship. I'm here, he stage whispered back. The guards didn't stand in their corridor at night. Their conversations had so far not been discovered. He had no idea what the penalty might be if they were overheard, but the risk seemed worth it. He had called to her as soon as the guards had left him alone that first night. She'd been slow to respond, terrified of the repercussions. Bart had spent the next thirty minutes standing at his window, sipping water, talking to her, trying to draw her out, telling her about himself and what had happened to him. If nothing else, if the girl survived and he did not, he figured that she might one day be able to tell his mother what had happened to him. But she had spoken, eventually. Not that what she'd said to him was in any way reassuring, other than to have someone sitting beside you on your metaphorical boat trip to hell. Sky, you okay? There was a sob and a cough. Sky Kelso was terrified. Bart knew how that felt, only she'd been there longer than him, and her previous fellow abductee was gone with no explanation. He tried, without success, to get Sky to talk about it. I have a cat, Sky said. I didn't tell you that, did I? No, Bart whispered. What's its name? Squash, she said. He could hear the smile in her voice. That was good. 
What colour? he asked. Tabby, obviously. That time, she actually laughed. It was the first time she'd done so since they'd begun speaking. Perhaps the first time in weeks. She'd lost track of how long it had been since she was taken, and he felt as if he'd scored the winning try at Murrayfield against the All Blacks. Rugby, he thought to himself. I used to love rugby. Used to. How had the tense changed so fast? What about you? Any pets? She followed up. No. I had a goldfish for a while when I was six. They all ended up swimming with the fishes. Can you say that about actual fish, or does it not work? She rewarded him with another laugh. You're funny, she said, so softly he had to jam his ear against the glass to hear. Tell me what you look like, he said. I want to be able to imagine your face. Okay, I'm five seven and a size ten, so average figure, I guess. Blonde hair down to my shoulder blades. I've been thinking about getting it cut, though. Don't, said Bart quickly. Not ever. Seeing her hair was the only good memory he had now. I have blue eyes, which makes me sound more glamorous than I am. In reality, they're a sort of muddy blue-grey. And my eyelashes are too thin, so I have to wear tons of mascara, otherwise I sort of fade into a pale mess in photographs. I don't believe you, he said. And that time, he could hear the smile in his own voice. It sounded foreign. It was true. And one of my ears is slightly larger than the other. My brother always teased me about it. He called me Lopsy for years when we were little. What's his name? Bart asked. Nick. He's kind. I mean, he's a pain in the ass, right? But he used to hug me when I cried. And if he was here now, he'd beat the shit out of these bastards. Sky laughed and sobbed in one go, sucking and spluttering air, thumping her forehead against the glass. They were both silent, immediately, waiting for someone to come and investigate. No one did. Sky, Bart said gently, would you talk to me about Malcolm? A pause. What's the point? I guess because I want to figure out what we're doing here, what they might have in store for us. Don't you want to know? No, she said her voice hard. It's nothing good. There's not going to be any happy ending. Figuring it out won't do any good. It'll just mean contemplating the worst before it even happens to us. Are you telling me you're not doing that already? I just want to forget it while we talk. Her breath hitched. Bart understood. He felt the same. Having a conversation was real and normal. Hearing about someone else's life, even someone locked in a room in the same corridor where you suspected your life might end quite soon, was better than being realistic about your own mortality. But he needed the reality check, and that had to start with information. Let's make a deal, Bart said. One question about all... He motioned around him pointlessly. All this. He didn't want to put a name to it. If he did that, she would never open up about Malcolm. The only reason he even knew the other man's name was because Skye had called him Malcolm by mistake in their first conversation and then gone on briefly, haltingly, to explain why. The details had ended there. And then one of us tells the other something personal from home. Skye sighed heavily. The sound and the emotion were like a curtain coming down. He started on a positive. I was in a play at the Fringe Festival last year, he told her. Not exactly a starring role. I was the back end of a hippo. It was a mock-up of a pantomime, and they thought a hippo would be funnier than the traditional cow. A belly laugh. That was great. Bart found himself grinning more than the audience had at the jokes in the show. So, Malcolm, what can you tell me about him? Where he came from, how old he was? He was twenty-two, 
He was from Glasgow originally, but his parents moved to Edinburgh when he was 12. He talked about skiing a lot. I think he was on some sort of team. He was here when I arrived. Did you ever see him? When he was being walked to the shower and back each morning. Then there was a day when a load of people went in his room all dressed in medical scrubs and masks. They had a load of medical equipment and a video camera with them. Two days later, they walked him out of his room. He smiled and waved as he walked past my window, but I think he knew... What? Bart asked. That he was never coming back? Her voice broke on the last word, and Bart gave her time to recover from the memory. What did he look like, physically? He was normal, you know, fit and healthy like you'd expect from a skier. He was a bit battered, but then he'd done the journey. The journey. Sky had talked for a minute or so about ending up in the box, then made it clear she never wanted to discuss it again. What's your favourite bar in Edinburgh? Mine's the newsroom on Leith Street. They do this amazing burger with chilli con carne. She sounded a long way away. Is that the bar that has all the jars with lights in the front window? He asked. It is. My friends took me there for my last birthday. My only regret is that I had too many cocktails and can't remember the last hour, but the next day my face was actually aching from laughing so much. I like the shum, Bart said. Amazing Indian food, Sky joined in. I'm more a restaurant person than a bar person. Not that I have the money for it very often. You'd hate where I work then, Sky said. It's a bar in a hotel on George Street. Most of the time it's fine, but on a Friday and Saturday night it gets a bit out of hand. That and hen parties. Really? I work in a restaurant. Sky, how much do you remember about when you were taken? Do I have to? She asked. Her voice younger, reluctant. Bart wished he could put his arms around her. Could you try? Fine, she said. I was working. It was a really late shift because the bar doesn't close until the last guest goes to bed and some film crew had been celebrating in there. They went through every type of vodka we had until two in the morning. Then I closed up. The next thing I remember is waking up. I don't want to talk about that again. That's okay. We don't have to. At the bar before you left, did anyone buy you a drink? Either someone you knew or a stranger? No. were not allowed to drink at work. We can take tips but not be bought anything. The management doesn't like the way that looks, even if it's just soft drinks. I always have a bottle of water around and sip it while I'm working. You get really dehydrated during an eight-hour shift, you know? Is that something you did all the time? Uh-huh. So anyone who'd come into the bar more than once might have seen where you put the water bottle back down. I suppose, she said. Was it accessible, the bottle? If you'd been busy serving people or clearing tables, could anyone have reached it? There was a long silence. Yes, she said. Even from across the bar. I wasn't that careful. Shit! Oh, shit, I work in a bar, I know what people do. Fuck it, this is all my own fault. Sky, no, it's not. You could never have anticipated this, not in a million years. She was crying. A woman I'd just started seeing bought me a drink after my shift and invited me back to her place. She left before me, said she was going to bring her car round. It's all fairly dim in my mind. I remember putting my jacket on, and I must have left on my own two feet or... Someone would have stopped me. Then, nothing. Sky was quiet. What about Malcolm? Did he remember anything? He was at the gym. That's all he told me. He'd seen plenty of people he knew there, so he figured the police would be able to trace his movements. He was freaked out about losing his mobile as he wanted to have his signal traced. You know, it's possible that Malcolm isn't dead. Maybe they were just moving him somewhere else. Bart did his best to sound convincing and failed. For what purpose? Sky replied. Maybe they just decided to let him go. 
Bart offered. Or maybe not, she replied. I'm tired. I'm going to try to sleep now. The inch-wide image of blonde hair disappeared from his view. Sky, he called after her. The blonde mass filled the crack of window again. When we get back to Edinburgh, I'm taking you to the newsroom. We'll eat whatever we want and drink cocktails, and I'll make you laugh, just like your friends did. That's a promise. First thing we'll do when we get home. Sure, she said. Right. Only, I'm not even sure anyone's looking for me. I just split up with my boyfriend, who was a total jerk, if I'm honest. I'd had a fallout with my parents over him. I'd threatened to go off the grid and just travel for a year to teach them all a lesson. I'd even started looking up destinations on my laptop. If anyone checks it, the last thing they'll find is me researching flights. The worst thing is, the night I left, I had my passport in my bag. I was thinking about going into one of those high street flight centres and picking a cheap holiday to anywhere. There was the sound of a fist hitting the wall. I'm screwed. We're screwed. We both know it. Bart thought about it. Your brother will know, he said. Nick will know you'd have been in touch by now. He'll be wondering what happened to Lopsy, right? A hand appeared at the glass where the hair had been. Bart could just make out her thumb and forefinger. I hope so, Sky said. God, I really, really hope so. Chapter 17 Three clients stood at the door to the flat. One was a regular, although he'd never been sent to Elinuta. He had a thing for another of the women, and made sure he was always there before the late-night rush. The second Elinuta had never seen before. He was large, and his eyes were slightly turned out from one another. The effect was disconcerting. As the women arranged themselves in the corridor, little more than tins on a supermarket shelf, the third man stepped out from behind the other two. Elanuta recognised him immediately, even with his top on and the scar on his stomach, hidden. Scalp my man, Finlay shouted from the doorway to Elanuta's bedroom. How are you doing? I've been meaning to call. He exited, fist extended, fingers to the floor and stood waiting for the man he'd called Scalp to respond in kind. His knuckles remained unbumped. Where are you meaning to? Scalp asked. That's fine then, only I was worried you were avoiding me. Avoiding you? You'd have to be my ex-missus for me to bother avoiding you. Finlay tried to raise a laugh. When none of the men at the door obliged, Elanuta took a half-step back. The other women looked on, some craning their necks forward to get a better view of the action. Scalp stayed where he was outside the flat. The other men who'd arrived with him remained at his side. The timing was no coincidence, Elanuta decided. Scalp grinned. Finlay beamed back. I want my money back from the race, Scalp said. I see. Finlay rubbed his chin. He might as well have declared that a time out for thinking was needed. Let's talk about this in the kitchen, shall we? No need for my girls to be wasting time when they should be on the job. You two lads can go and get yourselves comfortable. They're okay, Scalp said. Pussy can always wait. Right. Well, my place, my rules. So like I said, we'll go in the kitchen and the bitches can mind their own. Let's get a dram and find a way to sort this out. Finlay moved along the corridor towards the kitchen stopping when he realised Scalp wasn't following. The girls can stay where they are, Scalp said. Like you said, your place, your rules. So we'll discuss this out here. Neutral territory, if you like. Elinuta kept her head low, watching Scalp from beneath her hair and her lashes. 
she knew better than to give him cause to notice her after what she'd seen of the race. He was wiry, his hair receding and thin on top. There were bags under his eyes that told a tale of insomnia, and his chin was weak. His eyes, though, were darts. And Elinuta wished he would just leave. Finlay was a bastard, but at least he was a predictable bastard. Sure, mate, sure, Finlay said. But as far as the money for the race goes, you played fair and square. You knew what the price was. The girl I caught did herself in. By rights, she was mine to kill. A girl died at your hand. That was the agreement, Finlay said. His overly jolly voice, a perversity relative to the subject matter. You had a knife, pal. Let's not forget that it was you who broke the rules. The women around Elenuta took in a shocked breath all at once like an outgoing wave over pebbles. They knew nothing of the race, certainly not the details, even if they'd heard rumours. Did I sign something? Scalp asked, quietly, matching Finlay's false grin with a quiet smile of his own. I must have missed that. Come on, you've been to the race before. You knew the rules. You use your own hands or anything you pick up there. You can slam their head into the wall or shove their neck between two cupboard doors, but no weapons. If some twat decided to bring a gun, how would that be fair? Two thousand, and I want it today, Scalp announced, moving the conversation on as if he hadn't heard a word Finlay had said. <laughs> would you go fuck yourself? You didn't pay that much in the first place. Finlay said, the talk of so much cash dissolving his facade instantly. There'll be no return of your money, scalp, and I think you're forgetting who you're talking to. Interest is due, Finlay. Enough time has passed, and you made enough on the door to return ten times that to me. I looked like a cunt in front of all those people. I owed something for my reputation. That's a different thing now. Finlay said, rolling up his sleeves as if readying himself for a playground fight. His own men were at either end of the corridor, out of Scalp's line of sight, but Scalp had to have known they were there. Elenuta took a half step towards her bedroom. She saw it, Finlay said, pointing in her direction. She saw the video. What do you think? He reached out a hand, took Elenuta by the wrist, and pulled her into the space between Scalp and himself. Do you think Mr. Scalp there was made to look like a twat because of something added? Or do you think he managed that all by himself? Elenuta looked from the men hovering just outside the flat door to Finlay and his men, who were now approaching slowly and quietly. I not understand she muttered, with emergency diplomacy. The lie was hidden effectively beneath her genuine sense of panic. Standing between two rabid pit bulls had that effect. The thing is, Finlay, there's an awful lot of your punters that owe me. Money, favours, secrets, you name it. Your cash flow's going to take a hit if you can't maintain your reputation hereabouts. If I spread the word, for instance, that no one was to go to your next race, sure, you'd get a few idiots turning up, but generally speaking, you'd struggle to break even. Then there would be the knock-on effect with your flats and your women. And there are alternatives, you know. Other pimps offering more exotic flavours than these, if you know what I mean. Or I could tip the wink in your direction, put your competitors out of business. But only if you did the decent thing and refunded me for my disappointing experience. Finlay hesitated. He looked up the corridor to his second in command who shrugged his shoulders. All right then, Finlay groaned. But I want your word that you'll send people our way. My girls give as good a servicing as any they'll get in Edinburgh. I test them all personally. 
The woman nearest him shrank back into the wall as he reached for her. And I keep them good and scared so we don't get any shit from them. They do whatever anyone wants. Really? I heard one of them escaped recently. Something about a dead body stinking up the road. Aye. Well, that bitch has been taught a lesson she won't forget. Stay there. I'll get you your money. Finlay scowled as he walked past Elenuta to his tiny office in the box room at the end. He motioned to his men as he unlocked it, and they stood, hands in their pockets, the unsubtle bulk of guns deliberately visible. It took Finlay a while to emerge, clutching a thick handful of twenties and fifties. He looked pained, but the tension of the previous...